Now, we've had your notes, thank you very much. And um, uh, we have um, just about read them. Um, I thought that it might be helpful if I gave you some um, indications as to what we think we ought to do. As regards the assessment, um, I, I think I, we accept that on analysis, um, neither the way the judge nor the way the district judge treated it takes account of the present circumstances. And in those circumstances, it must be at large what happens, whether it's under the yeah. list of issues or not. So, Mr. Williams, what we would propose to do, if the appeal is allowed, is to decide what the costs should be, assess them ourselves, or send it back with hell argument, um, but not be bound by simply uh, reimbursing the, the money, even though your notice of appeal, I notice, only says you're appealing um, Mr. Justice Lavender's order that the appeal is allowed and that the £299 is... Paid. Yes, we're just seeking a reinstatement of the DJ's assessment. I take yes. the point that that was conducted on his, his we say, erroneous ruling. It was contentious business. Exactly. So um, we accept, although there's Mr. Dunn's uh, five pages, perhaps wasn't necessary to make that point, but... Um, Irrespective of, um, of where we were then, where we are now, means it would not be fair not to have a proper assessment on the basis of whatever base, whatever decision we make. Right. So if that's now common ground, you too will need today to address any arguments you want to on the assessment on both bases. Right. Is that okay? Um, my lord, the. My concern with regard to that uh, is that um, uh, the various arguments that could be put forward with regard to an assessment on a non-contentious business basis mm -hmm. have not been foreshadowed or dealt with in the skeleton arguments um, uh, before you. Uh, there are a number of points that, that could be taken if this was held to be non-contentious business. Uh, well, then take them. Well, speaking for myself, I, I think the idea that this goes back to the district judge, uh, regional cost judge in, in Sheffield, with the amount of money at stake, is, is frankly grotesque. Um, it, it's got to be dealt with, and it's got to be dealt with here. If you've got points, then make them. But, but that's my, I mean, I can't speak for my colleagues, but you, that's my view. Well, and if you, if, if you say to me at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> I've got so many points I want to make on this assessment uh, as to why non-contentious is different from contentious, and as to why the amount allowed should be less than even Mr. Justice Lavender allowed. I can't believe you're going to say that. Um, oh. Then uh, you can put something in in writing tomorrow. Because you're not here tomorrow. Um, uh, well, that's entirely correct. Um, my Lord, so far as um, I, I take the points that uh, uh, my Lord the Chancellor has made, um, I can indicate what the points are, I can go through them, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my Lord, the uh, issue is not going to be the reasonableness, it's going to be the question of fairness. Uh, and so I will certainly be seeking a uh, lower sum uh, than the sum uh, that was assessed uh, by uh, um, Regional Cost Judge Bellamy. Because he was assessing, as I say, on no, the I, contentious... I understand that, but I asked you if you were going to ask for a lower sum than Mr Justice Lavender. Well, Mr Justice... Um, I, I'm not. It depends what. 
I'm, I'm not seeking more money back, if that's, if, if that's the answer to your question. Uh, um, but uh, uh, I'm certainly not seeking... Uh, well, you're not seeking to argue for less than Mr Justice Lambda awarded? Um, no. You're, what you're seeking to argue is for something in between what the district judge awarded and what the judge awarded? What it amounts Which is to a, a part of £299.50. So for £150, your primary submission is this should go back to the district judge in the Treasury? Uh, my, Lord, my submission is it should go back to the regional cost judge uh, in Sheffield, um, and there are reasons why one has regional cost judges, uh, because of their expertise in relation to these matters, uh, and their experience of assessing bills. Well, thank you, Mr. Kathy, that's very good. We will hear your submissions on how much the bill should be on the basis that it's non-contentious costs per day. And you will need to persuade us uh, that we should allow you to put in further material, but if you um, wish to try that, you can. And we will hear your argument on why it should go back, I think we've heard it, why it should go back to the judge, and we'll deal with that in our judgments. Perfect. Okay, um, now we've got your, <coughs> we were at the stage of um, talking about fiduciary duty, uh, and now you tell us that it all turns on Mr Justice Fry in Davies and London and Provincial Marine Insurance Company, a case not mentioned in your skeleton. Um, case, case mentioned in um, um, an end friend for the Law Society's uh, skeleton argument. Have we got it in the bundle of authorities? It is in the bundle of first, authorities, first it's first actually the very first... Uh, authority, I believe. Listen. But just as a matter of first interest, Mr. Kirby, why is it not mentioned in your skeleton oh. if it forms such an important part of your argument? Well, I want to be fair to say that um, in the light of yesterday's uh, uh, educated exchanges, educated for me, not for anyone else, um, uh, that uh, obviously I had to uh, consider precisely how the matter should be put. Okay. Um, so I'm only tweeting your tail on. I, well, I, I, I apologise. It was irresistible, but I apologise <laughs> for not. Right. So, 8th Chancery Division 469. Yeah. And it's page. I mean, it is worth looking at because it is a, a remarkable case, isn't it? It starts at page 4, my lord. Well, the, the dictum is at page 9, really. And the dictum is at page 9 in the bundle. I don't think. Maybe my lord has had a chance to read it. So I no, no, I have. You have. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I, I have. So we'll so leave, we'll let the, my lord, the chancellor, read it because it is. It's uh, four seven four, is it? The sideline passage. Uh, yes, four seven four, page nine in the bundle, four seven four of the actual report. <coughs> let me just read that. Then. say that, um, well, first of all, uh, we say, as it says in the note, that uh, we also rely on the other duties that are owed as, as an assistance to, that uh, can assist the court with regard to uh, construing the provision. Um, so fiduciary duties is uh, one of the list of duties there. Um, fiduciary duties we accept were not, or we make the point, uh, are not referred to in uh, either Herbert uh, or McDougall, McDougall being the case relied upon by the, or uh, um, referred to by the Court of Appeal uh, in Herbert. We haven't looked at McDougall. But isn't, isn't, isn't Mr Justice Fry, in the first part of that dictum, he doesn't use the word fiduciary duty, but that's what he's talking about, isn't it? Well, 
I mean, the examples he gives... The examples are certainly of fiduciaries. Uh, are certainly of fiduciaries. Well, I don't know about Guardian and Ward, but I suspect that might be as well. I would have thought um, so. So he's talking about the situation where parties are going to contract with one another who've got a pre-existing relationship. So, I mean, it doesn't focus on what it is that's... that's um, I mean, this is actually a marine insurance case, isn't it? No. Or is it, is it not? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's actually somebody paying money to avoid a, a friend being prosecuted. Sorry? No. The actual contract was, was a sh contract of surety ship. No. St standing surety for someone who was at risk of being prosecuted for embezzlement. Oh, um, yeah. It, it is all over to, isn't it? I mean, this wasn't a solicitor's case at all. Uh, it was not a solicitor's case, no. And on the analysis that Mr Justice Fry adopts, it wasn't a case of one of these special relationships, of a fiduciary relationship. It, um, thank you. It, it was a bank taking money, taking a surety, a guarantee, from some friends of one of the bank's employees who were suspected of embezzlement. That's what it was. And there was no pre-existing relationship. So, so this is this is all Overton. Well, it doesn't mean it's it doesn't mean it's wrong. But doesn't it, mean it's wrong. It is, but it, it means is, he's it not actually right. focusing on the case of a fiduciary relationship. No, but but um, uh, we would rely on the um, uh, uh, facts, obviously, uh, of this case uh, that where you do have a pre-existing. Um, uh, relationship, albeit for a matter of days, that that does change the complexion of the matter. Okay. Uh, I, Lord... understand, I understand that point. But, I mean, it is clearly the case that if you have a fiduciary relationship, trustee and beneficiary, solicitor and client, and so on, and you enter into a transaction such as in Nocturne and Ashburton, then you do owe a duty of a full disclosure, otherwise you can't you can't hold the client to the contract. But the, the the question we have to face is whether that applies to a contract for your own fees, where it's obvious that your interests are opposed to well, that of the client. My lord, can I? Um, I'm sure an example I'm thinking of on my feet is possibly not the best, but um, can I try it? Um, my lord, um, uh, let's say that. Uh, I went to firm of solicitors uh, to uh, ask them to act in relation to uh, a conveyancing transaction. And um, I'm buying from a developer, uh, and uh, it turns out uh, I subsequently find that the solicitor is a part owner of the development company. I don't have a problem with that. With that being yeah. something you could set aside. Well, well, I don't have yeah. a problem with that at all. Well, well but, 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 my lord, that's, that's, but that's a classic case. Well, well but in of, a, of a conflict of interest which isn't disclosed and which is which is caught by the fiduciary duties, uh, Mr. Lord Justice Millet spells out. But if the solicitor in that scenario gave me the information about his ownership of part of the development company. Uh, that is something that might affect my decision whether to use that firm of solicitors, and if having told me, uh, I could decide whether to go ahead or whether to say, well, if, as you're involved, I'm not going to get in, uh, involved in the matter. In this case, if the solicitor is not telling me how much is actually going to be recovered, indeed is mis we'd say misleading us as to how much is going to be uh, recovered. That is a similar uh, uh, similar information that will affect my decision whether to go ahead with him or not. Or yes, her. yes, but there is a there is a conceptual difference between the sort of transaction where you're taking some undisclosed profit and this transaction where the amount that the solicitors were charging was plainly disclosed. And the question is, do you, do you have to give further information, and, and that's what we're grappling with. Well, I mean, now, I don't think it helps to bring in analogies 
with secret profits or yeah. uh, hidden commissions or all the other classic fiduciary duty cases because we all agree that in those cases yeah. you can't hang on to something which is, there's a plain breach of, of the duties of, your, of your loyalty. Example, your example is a classic secret profit case. Yes. Well, what, we're, what, well, what is it. difficult and what is causing us difficulties is that what you're doing in this case is not taking anything secret or hidden or um, where there's a, 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 an obvious breach of the duty of loyalty. What you're doing is stipulating for your own fees where it is perfectly plain, as I said, that your interests are not aligned with those of the client but are directly opposite. And, and the question is, which I think is quite a simple question to ask but it's not necessarily a simple question to answer, do you as a matter of the law of fiduciary duty, have to spell out to the client in black and white precisely how much you're going to take by way of fees and what the consequences for them will be. That's the question. And I don't think that, with respect, what Mr Justice Fry says, Obiter, is, is going to answer that question directly. Well, Lord, what we say in this matter is that the client is not told what she's going to be charged because she cannot know what she's going to be charged unless she is told what proportion of those costs are going to be recovered. You never, so, I you never know. Well, my, my Lord, the, the fault is forgive me, the that's, that's not, not correct. The fault, the fault here is in not spelling out well, it's, it's, there are two faults. One is not saying uh, we won't actually ever take the 12, the, the 2,500, it'll only be whatever it is, 800, or it'll be the fixed cost plus whatever. And the other fault, fault is in not saying if your case settles at a particular point in time, then the most you'll ever get from the other side is X. And there are, I mean, you say there are all sorts of other permutations you might. You might have uh, might have to put on a piece of paper or something. But I mean, mo most solicitors will will say to a client, um, "You you know, here is an estimate of what, what how much this litigation will cost you. You may be able to get um, some of this back from the other side on a, on a, an assessment." But I mean, most solicitors these days, I suspect, are a bit more cautious than than they used to be, and they say, "Well, you might only get fifty percent back." If well, you said that, that would be fine. I mean, that's, you know, that's sort of... Well, we would suggest there's a world of difference between the cases that came before my Lord in the uh, commercial court and um, uh, Mr and Mrs Smith who go into the solicitors who, have had, who have had a, um, a prang, someone's gone into the back I of their car. I understand, but the principle must be the same, must not it? Well... Uh, if the solicitor no, is a duty to say something, what, what... Well, yes, but the duty of what, what their duty is... Sorry start that sentence again, um, uh, what information they are required to provide in order to fulfil that duty will depend upon the sophistication of the client. So in a case, in, in, um, uh, uh, a case where you have a sophisticated uh, businessman who's involved in commercial litigation, um, first of all, there aren't going to be any fixed costs. No, that's true. Uh, and um, uh, that, if he's a long, he or she's a long-standing client, well, they probably know the score anyway. Here we're talking about, and, and uh, we mustn't uh, no lose evidence. focus that this no is the portal. There's of what we're talking about here, Mr. Kirby. So if you're saying uh, that the fulfillment of the duty depends on the sophistication of the client, the only thing I can assume is that your client is a highly sophisticated person who's using solicitors all day long because you've put in no evidence about anything about it at all and so you can't if I may say so get away with that I fully understand that your submission is that there is a duty on a solicitor who's already been retained which she ha they had here there is a duty to give full information about the case and in a sense, we're arguing about a very small compass because in the co 
conditional fee agreement, it expressly says that they have a duty to give you full information. It, the solicitor has a duty to give full information about the costs they will charge. Right? That those are the words used in the conditional yes. fee agreement. But it doesn't go as far as the duty of care in the code of conduct, which is a duty to give full information so you can decide what to do, and full information about costs more generally, which would probably cover, I'm sure you would say it would, uh, the information about the £500 being recovered and that they wouldn't take the full £2,500. Mm. So we're in a very small compass here, but what you're saying is that the duty is more extensive than provided in the contract because of some implication. And what I think the court is balking at is that you, you can't sort of, um, you, you have to say why. <laughs> and um, if it's fiduciary duties, fine, that's your argument, that's what the judge held. Um, I know you say that's correct. If you say it's duty of care, I don't think I really understand that at the moment. I'm not sure it's what Mr. Justice Fry was saying either. Fine, you can say that, although you probably should have done a respondent's notice, but um, we can forget about that for a minute. My understanding is your case is simply two things, really, pleaded case anyway. It's 46.92. Yes. It's to be implied from that, because 46.92 is positioned next to 46.93, or it's fiduciary duties. Now... I just want to be clear whether there's anything else that we need to be dealing with beyond those two reasons for implying um, what we're calling for a shorthand, but not a very accurate shorthand, fully informed consent. No. Okay. Um, just to pick up on sorry. that, I mean, the duty of care point doesn't seem to me at least to get you to fully informed consent. It might get you to something else in, in certain circumstances. It might get you to, to, to a complaint to the SRA or to the Ombudsman or whatever. Um, but it doesn't get you, I don't think, to, to, to fully informed consent under 4692. I mean, I understand the judge's reasoning saying the fiduciary duty gets you there because he says, well, that's, a, if you like, a, an overlay over the whole relationship. But I don't think duty of care gets you. I think there's another problem with duty of care, which is if it's a common law duty, it's either contractual or tortious, and the remedy is damages. But in order to get damages, yeah, you have to show it would have made a difference. And, and, and if the client had been told, well, technically we, we can charge you 2,500. In practice, what we'll do is we'll charge you about 20% of your damages, which if you get 2,000 will be about 300 quid. Once we've got 500 quid from the other side, then who knows whether the client would have gone ahead or not. So you can't get damages unless, you, unless you've got evidence to that. Well, there's no evidence. And, and, and it's not an assessment point anyway. I mean, I mean, and if the reality is that this, is, this, this practice, at least in 2016, was prevalent amongst solicitors to do this sort of work, then that there's, an, there's an issue there as to whether the client would ever have got anything. Now, well, we, a different firm. Well, Mr. there Kebby, is evidence. Mr. Mr. Kebby, I, oh, I think the bench has done a lot of talking. Yes. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Yes. 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 I'm, I'm, I'm lapping it all up, my lord. It's done correctly. Uh, no, I know. Well, but I, I, I would like an answer to my question. You'll have to remind me what it was. Uh, I'll remind you what it was. And then I'm going to enjoin <laughs> or plea that we um, let you get on with your yes. submissions. Um, Point two. I'm not being trying not to be critical at all of anybody. So it is, these are very interesting and difficult points, we know that. But the question I do want an answer to is there really any other legal basis beyond fiduciary duties and an implication arising from the proper meaning of part 46.92 that gets the client, your client, to a requirement 
that the solicitor that she fully she gives fully informed consent to the fee arrangement, which includes knowing the two things my lord mentioned. Uh, my lord, I do pray and aid the regulatory duties in terms of um, uh, the proper interpretation of the provision. Yes, but, to, but how do regulatory duties? I mean, is there a is there a, is it an implied term of the contract that your regulatory duties are? I, I don't think I can go that far because I think the um, law on that is is that it's not an implied term of the uh, uh, contract. Um, Well, one might say, well, why in Herbert? Why in MacDougall um, is it informed approval? I realise that's in relation to 4693. Um, because it says so. Because it says so. Well, that she said. It doesn't say informed. It says approval. It just says approval. It doesn't say informed approval. Mm -hmm. It's the Court of Appeal that has said that that approval has to be informed. So that is why I said yesterday. What really is the difference between the word agreement, express agreement, and the word approval? Yes. And I also said yesterday, and uh, repeat very briefly now, is that the courts have, over decades, if not hundreds of years, taken particular care with regard to uh, uh, looking at the relationships between solicitors and clients. And that is the reason why perhaps uh, the word approval, if it came in another context, or agreement, if it came in another context, might not require fully informed agreement or fully informed approval, but why it does with regard to solicitors. So 46... 46.93... refers to express or implied approval. 46.92 refers to a written agreement which expressly permits. And in our submission, take, uh, just to confirm the point that my Lord the Master of the Royals said, in our submission, they should be construed and 46.9 should be construed in the whole, in the round. But what if it doesn't apply? What if what doesn't apply, my lord? 46.92. Well, if 46, if, uh, what, because... Um, 74.3 doesn't apply. If 74.3 doesn't apply. Well, then, uh, dead in the water, aren't I? Yeah. But that's <laughs> what I'm really driving at. Because yeah. I thought this argument, I thought we'd gone beyond 46.92. I mean, I completely understand you. But if 46.92 doesn't apply, you've still got fiduciary duties, right? You've still got um, fiduciary duties, but, but my fiduciary duties um, uh, would, uh, uh, and a breach of those fiduciary duties, would be relevant to fairness, but would not kick in at 46.92. Well, hang on a moment. I think it's important we clarify that because um, I thought what we were on was like my lord was was fiduciary duties because there was a fiduciary duty um, there was they did not have an entitlement to claim uh, the total fees is that is that the point and then and now you say well it's to do with the fairness. Now, the decision of Mr Justice Lavender, um, uh, as one can see from the judgment, mm. uh, he had heard submissions from myself and Mr Bacon, uh, King's Counsel, and subsequently we had a note from the judge, this is referred to uh, in the judgment, we had a note <coughs> from the judge saying, can you address me, I can't off the top of my head remember the precise terms, but basically, can you address me with regard to fiduciary duties? Um, and there was reference, I think, to, I, I think he sent to us a couple of passages and asked us to comment on that. This is all from my recollection, so um, 
Uh, it's in the, in the judgment. I think that's right. So, yeah. so we, we then provided uh, written submissions just on the fiduciary duty point, and then we had the judgment. So the but, fiduciary... But the judgment, just to pause there, the judgment is on two bases. It's on the point you're making to us about 46.92. Uh, he says, read it alongside Herbert and three. And he said, anyway, this arises from fiduciary duty. Yes, but I... I, well, I mean, he, he puts it on both bases. Well, maybe I've missed a point, because <laughs> my, my understanding of the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Lamont was that he was uh, seeking to explain why informed approval was re or uh, informed agreement was required for the purposes of 46.92. What was the basis of it? Yeah, okay. um, and he referred, so he, he was he saying, uses well... in fiduciary duty as a bolster, if you like, to why yeah. 46.92 means informed approval. Yes. Or informed consent. Yes, yes. Um, so he wasn't, as it were, looking at it uh, at fiduciary duties in, in, a, in a broader no. context. No, no, no. Um, I, I mean, I beg, I slightly beg to differ on that. Um, when you look at the reasoning, um, which comes in at, um, it says, that, um, when he says, is informed consent required? He says, um, in 68, I don't consider this appeal can be determined by a simple comparison between the wording of two and three. The requirement for informed consent does not arise because of the use of the word approval rather than the word agreement. The requirement arises because of the fiduciary nature of the agreement. It goes without saying it must be a valid and enforceable agreement. It follows, for example, that an agreement procured by fraud would not suffice nor would an agreement whose performance would involve a breach of fiduciary duty. So he does knit the two together, yeah. but without fiduciary duties, he wouldn't have so found. Uh, well, he... he um, I mean, it may not matter, because we're yeah. a long way from Mr Justice Lavender now. Yes. Um, the point that uh, I was seeking to make, which I think is a narrower point than perhaps this court was assuming I was making, um, is that the question of fiduciary duty was the reason why Mr. Justice Lavender um, held that 46.9.2 required informed consent. Well, he didn't say that. Well, as my lord says, he goes, he slightly goes backwards and forwards. In that first uh, uh, passage my lord read, he, he seems to be saying it's informed consent because it's a fiduciary relationship. He's not actually tying it to 46.92. But he then goes on in the next paragraph to, to say that's why 46.92 requires informed consent. So it's slightly um, confused. Well, and, and by the way, this is why I started the appeal back in February by saying this whole thing is on a false basis because I recognised that if he was wrong about 4692 applying at all um, then the whole of the argument had, had got off to a wrong start but it might be that he was right about fiduciary duties but wrong about 4692 yeah. if um, going back to uh, my Lord the Chancellor's uh, question, I think. Um, if uh, 46.92 doesn't apply because section 74.3 is not engaged, then breaches of duties, whether they are fiduciary, regulatory, or common law, or contractual, are then relevant to an assessment of a fair, um, uh, 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 an assessment carried out on the basis of fairness, 
when fairness is an addition to reasonableness. So if I say the to my... Difficulty, the difficulty, I understand that, but I mean, in a sense, um, the, with the, the, that would be fine if the solicitors had, had tried to charge the 2,500 less the 500, because then you could say, well, 2,000 quid was just far too much, and they should have told me a lot more. But the reality is they only charged whatever it was, 800 and, I forget, I mean, the figures, there's so many figures, like this, 800 and something. Whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever it was. <laughs> so it, it's very difficult to say, in circumstances where there's no evidence from the client that she would have done anything different. Well, very difficult to say, well, that goes to the fairness of the fees that were actually charged, which is the subject of the bill. Well, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that, that these fixed costs have been determined, by the secondary legislation, but been determined by Parliament, were supposed to be reasonable fees with regard to the carrying out of work. Well, they're reasonable fees between um, party and party, aren't they? Well, they, the they are... 500 uh, pounds. They are fees um, that have been set, and they were reduced when um, referral fees were, yeah. um, and they were reduced not not because you know uh, yeah, they were reduced yeah, because solicitors yeah. then didn't have to pay referral but, fees. But, but Parliament has recognised that, that that solicitors are not limited to the fixed costs that they can oh, charge absolutely. a success fee or whatever it happens to be. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, I'm, but but my I must. Pay attention to my lord's <laughs> but, too much. But absolutely, and uh, you know, a client is perfectly entitled. I don't know whether um, Herbert Smith do any portal cases, probably not. But uh, a client's perfectly entitled to go to um, a firm of solicitors who don't normally do that sort of work uh, and uh, want to charge their normal rates of four or five hundred pounds an hour. Now, there'd be all sorts of other arguments then, because those would be unusual amounts, etc., and we'd be in forty-six nine three territory. Um, but um, Parliament has, does not say you cannot charge more than fixed costs. And the point um, uh, I may have made at the beginning yesterday, and I certainly meant to in my very opening remarks, is that this case is not about solicitors uh, not being able to charge reasonable sums, or indeed, it, one might say, almost unreasonable sums uh, of their clients. This case is about if, if they're going to charge uh, more than the fixed recoverable costs, then the client should be given information about that so that they can make an informed decision. So it's not seeking to, it's not seeking to, to restrict what solicitors can do. It's requiring solicitors to actually comply with certainly their regulatory obligation. Uh, I hear what the, the court says with regard to fiduciary, but certainly with regard to the regulatory obligations to give their clients the best information with regard to cost. And there can be no doubt in our submission that in this matter, best information would have required, we've made this point a number of times, best information would have required giving an indication to the client of the costs that would be recovered by way of fixed costs. And that indeed is the method that, that um, Lord Justice Jackson suggested in his report. Show them the grid. It's not that difficult. Um, uh, which uh, uh, sets out what sums you would then recover. Yeah. Forgive me, um, my Lord, Master Lord. Um, I can't now remember if I have answered your question. Because um, <laughs> we've gone off again. <laughs> well, I think you have in a manner of speech. <laughs> Good point. Um, My understanding is the question was if we're not in, I think we all understand how your argument works if we're in Section 74 3 territory. If we're not in Section 74 3 territory, what is your argument? And I think the answer you gave was it feeds into the fairness assessment for non-contentious costs. If we're, if we're not in 74.3, we're in fairness. But what, but, and, and whatever the duties are, they impinge upon fairness, that's it. Absolutely, that, that's it. Yeah, great. Do you mind if I just uh, have a quick word of my, uh, turn my back just for a moment?
Yeah, I mean, it's just, in a sense, an example of the point that I've made. But um, if one uh, there's obviously been significant references to the legal ombudsman, and in our skeleton argument of page 214 of the supplemental bundle, Mm -hmm. paragraph. paragraph 7 mm -hmm. um, there's reference to uh, uh, another key factor is the cost benefit yeah. analysis cost risk analysis that's the point that my lord or Justice Nugent made yesterday, in fact, may even be in day before. Um, a service provider should clearly explain the likely costs and what they can expect to recover, looking at whether the costs are proportionate. It's an important discussion to have with the customer. We've seen cases where the cost benefit hasn't been properly considered or explained, and a moderate claim has left the customer worse off because the fees incurred were higher than the claim itself. We would expect the customer to be informed as to what the service provider will charge if they win their case so they can make an informed decision as to whether to instruct that service provider or look elsewhere. Yeah. Uh, well, just on that point about looking elsewhere, um, uh, there is evidence put in by uh, the witness statement of Mr. Carlisle, which obviously does indicate um, other options, other types of uh, CFA. And indeed, my learned friend, um, uh, uh, Mr. Holland, King's counsel on behalf of uh, the Law Society, referred to uh, CFA lights. Mm. Of course, CFA lights are uh, CFA uh, lights are obviously uh, a CFA where you do simply uh, recover what is is paid. It may be a CFA light um, a, a modification of a CFA light with then a success fee, but a CFA light is going to be restricted. Um, to the amounts that are recovered from the other side. Uh, and those are, are available. There are firms who do, who do that. Indeed, uh, if one looks at, admittedly it was at an earlier stage, if one looks at the Gavin Edmondson decision, just on the facts in that case, those were CFA lights. And indeed the clients in those CFAs, which is the previous iteration of the Law Society model CFA, uh, was told what the... Um, uh, fixed costs would be. That's right. So they were higher at that stage because it was before the ban on referral fees. Mm. Um, my Lord, whilst though we're in our skeleton argument, I wonder if I could ask you to turn the page to 215, it's paragraphs uh, 10 and 11. This is your skeleton. This is our skeleton. I hope it is. This is your response to, to Mr. Dixon's. No. Yes, it was a supplemental. <coughs> I mean, uh, paragraph so. 10 and 11. 10 starts, that is not an unduly onerous requirement. No, I'm so sorry, it was it's page 215 of our supplemental skeleton argument. Oh, sorry, let me just um, find that. 215 in the court supplemental order. bundle. Supplementary. So, okay. Thank you. Payment by result is likely different. I mean, yeah. what Mr. Carlyle did in, um, uh, or what, what this short uh, supplementary um, uh, skeleton sought to do was to draw attention to, uh, you may recall that Mr. Dixon's uh, witness statement has hundreds of pages of exhibits to it. It takes up the whole of uh, supplementary bundle two, if one has hard copy. Uh, and so what this uh, uh, supplementary skeleton argument sought to do was to highlight uh, some of the documents included within that exhibit to illustrate the requirements that there are, or the guidance that has been given uh, by um, uh, the Law Society uh, with regard to costs and the need uh, for um, uh, particular information to be given. So paragraph 10 deals with um, uh, a, a document, an advisory document 
uh, called Payments by uh, Results. Um, paragraph 11 deals with the Contentious Cost Guide. which, as it happens, did actually uh, uh, have a warning about not complying with 48.81a, which is now 46.92. Uh, and uh, refers to the initial retainer being in contentious matters. Well, that's an argument obviously we've had, and I'm not going to go over that again. Um, but in particular, um, at, at 46. Uh, there is further 4692 warning, of, this is a subparagraph D, in the specific context of fixed recoverable costs under CPR 45 at 114, the warnings incorporated in the section expressly directed at claims proceeding under pre-action protocol for low value personal injury claims. Um, the Law Society clearly considered these costs to be contentious and or to be caught by 4692. Um, well, what I've done is taken you to a skeleton argument, obviously I should have taken you to the the document itself. Is that necessary? Well, my lord, forgive me just for a moment while I find the relevant page. So, my lord, it's in the second supplementary bundle at page 484. part of the exhibit is part of the lengthy exhibit to Mr. Dixon's witness statement. And the document that's at 484 starts on 469. And you'll see it's the Contentious Costs Practice Advice Service, June 2012. Yeah. Uh, and at say at page 484 in the bundle, uh, there is specific guidance with regard to the protocol. Um, which uh, at that time was limited to claims up to £10,000. You'll see that on the first paragraph. Provides for fixed stages and costs with set deadlines. Then refers to there being um, fixed recoverable costs uh, for those cases that leave the portal. Mm. And then there's the paragraph <coughs> uh, that I referred to and was referred to in our skeleton argument, as mentioned above, see client retainer. The practical effect of 48A is that in every contentious matter, Assessor should ensure that the client signs a written agreement as to his terms of business. Uh, without this, on the assessment of any item in county court proceedings, the sister may not be able to recover any more from this client than the client would have recovered from the other side. They may be of particular importance where a sister seeks to recover more than fixed costs in a case in which fixed costs would apply. Now, um, I'm sorry? 485. Four, um, and I remember Mr. Holland's asked me to take you to page uh, 485. Is, is the reference to 48.8 a reference to a predecessor of yes. 46.92? It's the previous version, I'm sorry, it's the previous version of 46.9. Because this is actually 2012. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. Is we couldn't right find at that stage. Was 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 forty six nine two? It was forty eight eight one a one a one big a. 
Did it include what's what's now forty six nine three? Was that somewhere else? Oh no, no, that, that was already there. What was what, it in the same in the same? Yeah, forty eight point eight. I think that was forty eight point eight two. I think I think three was two. Um, because what I, I think my well, friend um, Mr. Williams may have referred to this. Yeah, I've got. Okay, don't don't take up time. But yes, it's the it's the forerunner basically. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, my learned friend Mr. Holland asked me to draw attention to uh, on page four eight five. So it's, it's the passage under contentious business agreements in four eight five, and a similar passage occurs in relation to the non contentious business agreements guidance five two seven. So where's the non-contentious business agreement? It's 527. The, the, the text of the passage is almost identical. Top of 527. Yeah, same word. Otherwise, don't do it. Well, 485 yeah. also has <laughs> a section... Um, headed conditional fee agreements. Uh, conditional fee agreement is a type of contingency fee agreement which is permitted for contentious business, provided it, re it meets uh, requirements uh, re contained in section 58. Uh, CFAs are beyond the subject matter of this booklet. Um, so, uh, the, the, the Law Society guidance at, at that stage, and, and Mr. Dixon does not produce any um, uh, updated version of, of uh, any such guidance for contentious costs. Uh, the guidance um, uh, at that stage clearly um, suggested that conditional fee agreements were in relation to contentious business. The Sorry, I've just well, uh, forgive me. I, I, I shouldn't have spoken so loudly. I apologise. But since uh, it says they're permitted for contentious business because the use of con conditional fee agreements was previously controlled in contentious business. They've always been permitted for non-contentious business, so all it's doing is spelling out it's permitted for contentious business. My Lord, conditional fee, well, my Lord, we've been to sections 58 and uh, 58A. Uh, those deal with the introduction of conditional fee agreements uh, and say what is required with regard to them. At one stage, there were significant requirements, um, and I referred to the now revoked regulations with regard to, for instance, stipulation proceedings, etc., and all the other complications that, are, that were there. Um, but Lord, this uh, the pre-action protocol is uh, in the section of uh, guidance that's dealing with uh, contentious costs. Question of 
fairness. Yeah. I know one hour five minutes in, I'm, I'm now going to go to a list of short points that I meant to uh, pick up on at the beginning, which uh, came over from yesterday. Um, my Lord, so far as the Solicitors Act and the bundle is concerned, my Lord, the Master Roll has expressed concern that the whole of Part 3 wasn't there. We think, in fact, the whole I of think, Part I 3 think is, it is one way or yeah. another, yeah, um, yeah. A bit unfair, sorry. Um, uh, my Lord, and the. I was using an earlier version. Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid we've given you even more paper, that's trouble. Um, my Lord, a. I went through um, a number of uh, uh, reasons, I think I gave seven yesterday, why these are uh, proceedings. Um, the one point I did not make and should have made is in our skeleton argument at paragraph 79. That's page 149 in the supplementary bundle. Yeah. Um, where we draw attention to um, the fact that the specific fixed cost rules are rules of court made pursuant to the Civil Procedure Act, Section 1. And Section 1 of the Civil Procedure Act says there are to be rules of court governing the practice and procedures to be followed in and one yeah. of the places it's to be followed in is obviously the Caps Court. Mm -hmm. So, um, but bearing in mind that there are rules in the CPR that deal with the fixed costs and uh, the portal, um, that uh, therefore uh, that is perhaps point eight um, uh, with regard to why these should be considered uh, as proceedings. My Lord, the Master of the Rolls um, uh, yesterday referred to a uh, 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 decision of um, Lord Kitchen uh, on the question of updating construction. Yeah. Uh, my Lord, we've um, provided a, a copy of that. My Lord, my What's he called? Um, CE Education. Yes. And I think my Lord may have... What's it called? S -E S -S -A -E education. I think it's that one. Yeah. What what paragraph do we? Well, my, <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that one. Um, <laughs> uh, um, it is. If I, if I can buy my copy, I, it um, is the case that uh, doesn't uh, actually deal with the point at all. Thanks. Okay. Um, my lord. There is a passage um, which I'm now struggling with. My Lord, there's probably I think it's 38. I think there's probably more of a discussion of the principles in the subsequent case that the Master of the Rolls yes. referred to in this court, which mentioned the, this particular. So I think it's a. Times newspapers case. It's another VAT yeah, case which yeah. is going. I think Masters mm -hmm. may have been thinking of that because you do mention that this case in that. But there's maybe more of a discussion of the um, um, general principle in that case. Well, both cases were both the case of well, the Master of the Royals dealt with and this case were both VAT cases. And um, I wouldn't for one moment um, profess to know anything at all about that. Um, on the fact I have to pay it every three months, <laughs> um, but uh, my lord, the uh, my understanding from um, reading this decision and indeed my lord's decision in the subsequent case mm. is that that there has to be a very strict construction with regard to exceptions uh, in relation to that law, and that that is a relevant consideration um, uh, with regard to. Um, uh, applying any updating construction. Um, in the case that my Lord 
dealt with. Um, it was a question of newspapers and whether it covered digital newspapers. <coughs> yes. Um, and I think, um, I do apologise, I don't have that case before me, but my, no doubt my Lord will recall. I'll get his um, I, th uh, well, I, I think my Lord did, found that it was restricted, that it's restricted to physical um, uh, 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 newspapers uh, and didn't apply to. So, in other words, those are cases which what go against the concept of yes. Or not, you see. They go they go against it in the sense that within the context of um, uh, VAT, the exceptions um, uh, uh, have to be relatively limited. Do, do you have the reference for the Times newspapers case? Even the name. Um, it's it's Revenue and Customs uh, versus News Corp UK and Ireland Limited. I have think you got a mutual citation for it? I'm, if, if my computer will allow me, uh, I'll get that. Within the, I can get it, I'll send it to. 2021 PWCA Step 91, I think. Just check. Okay, 20. I think it's 20, yes, 2021. EWCA SIV 91. It was an appeal for Mr. Justice Akaroli. Is that um, right. But Lord, so far as uh, updating construction with regard to this particular matter. Uh, we say again you look at the purpose of the act and does uh, the portal come within uh, 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 county court proceedings does it come within what was sought to be governed by that restriction on the recovery of costs so in the county court uh, there were scale and or fixed costs. That was replaced in the light of advances in technology and in the light of um, a, a desire to make uh, certain claims be dealt with quickly and uh, more efficiently. Uh, and that was one of the reasons for the portal being introduced. But if, if, if Parliament was going to introduce Section 74.3 with regard to uh, uh, county court um, scale fees or fixed fees, uh, we say that costs under a uh, portal governed uh, uh, by the rules of the, screen, uh, the uh, CPR and governed by uh, practice directions um, that that is the same sort of procedure that was uh, envisaged when um, prior to the uh, development of a portal. So that is the same sort of dispute resolution mechanism. I, it's a formal mechanism, it's governed by court rules, uh, and it is dealt with as a way of dealing with small claims where there should be a restriction on the amount of costs if that is... Uh, if those uh, costs have been laid down uh, uh, in the rules. So we say, I can't remember, now remember which way around it was, whether it was a dog or cat, but we say it, it, it's another form of dog and it's not a cat. Um, and if it was the other way around, we say it's another form of cat and not a dog. It's a dog, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we've, we've just been looking at this again. I'm sorry for interposing with my no defence permission. I think, in fact, we may have just inadvertently led the court slightly up the garden path. I think when my Lord the Master of Wales yesterday remembered a case in which he had cited a dictum of Lord Kitchen, a recent dictum of Lord Kitchen on the always speaking principle, um, there is a case where the Master of Wales does cite Lord Kitchen, um, but he also cites uh, um, Lords Reeds, Hodge, 
Lloyd Jones, Hamblin et al. in a case called Frank's Investment. I was going to say, I'm just looking at it in and my I Lord's think, judgment. And I think, I, I think that that perhaps is the passage that my Lord it's was thinking of. It's the Frank Investment of. Income Group uh, case. Yes, it? so yeah. if, I don't know if my Lord, the yeah, Master of Elders, has, has got his decision up on the internet, but it was paragraph 61 of that. I wanted the to Times, In the Times newspaper case, 61, 62... It's 61, 62, 63 in Times. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, the most well. recent application is to be found in Frank Investment. That's the one. So I, I, I forgive. I, I think the reference to Lord Kitchen threw us off the scent, but I suspect that's what you're, you're that's looking at in mind. I think that's right. Um, and and the reference to dogs is quoted from Quintervale. Um, yes. Quintervale. Quintervale. Uh, Quintervale. Fifty-nine. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just couldn't remember which way around. The Parliament, how long ago, passed an act to flip all the dogs? It could not properly be interpreted. Acts, but it could apply held to apply to animals not regarded as dogs when the act was passed, but are so regarded now. Yes. And you say this is a. I say this is still a this dog. is a, a dog now. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, these are proceedings now. Is what you're saying? Yes. yes. That on uh, updating in the county court. That these uh, are proceedings begun in the in the county court that should be construed, applying a purposive, I can never say that word, and an updating construction um, to include claims in the court judgment. For the seven reasons I gave yesterday, plus the additional reason I gave this morning. Yeah. So I won't go over. Can I um, now come on to the um, uh, Consumer Rights Act? Um, well, the uh, Act itself is, or relevant parts of it, Uh, section 5 in the statutory material starts on page 69. Yeah. Well, can I just check with my little junior what was forwarded to the court two days ago? What was forwarded to the court two days ago was four separate PDF documents which could at least have been put in one PDF document. Section 71 and 71. What was forwarded to um, court two um, days ago which should have been put in one yeah. PDF? Um, uh, was uh, uh, another section and, the exp and some of the explanatory notes. Uh, section 71 to and the explanatory notes. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, seven, section 71 is one of those uh, sections one certainly didn't used to have um, that the court is required uh, to consider whether a term is fair even if None of the parties to the proceedings has raised that or indicated that it intends to raise it. But or even at court of appeal level, after the parties have argued and filed um, respondents' notices that say precisely what they're arguing. Well, is that are, are you saying that allows you to go beyond your respondents' notice? Well, um, uh, my lord, the the act says what it says. No, but I'm asking what you're arguing. Uh, What's the relevance of uh, this? In other words? Our, res our, res our respondent's notice uh, is limited to the impact of the Consumer Rights Act on Section 74.3. So which term of the CFA you're inviting us to, to, to look at 
in the context of the duty imposed on the court in section 71? Uh, it would be uh, the term that says that the uh, uh, solicitors can charge more than the amount that could be recovered. What the term that says that they can recover more than? Yes, sorry, I haven't quite fixed more than the fixed cost that they, that they could recover from the other side. More than they, they re, yes, more than recover. It's, it doesn't in that particular term. So the term that the term that is, if section seventy four three doesn't apply, it, if section that term doesn't isn't hit by. Either section seventy four three or forty six nine two. If seven if seventy four three doesn't apply, mm. then on our respondents' notice, um, the Consumer Rights Act point doesn't add anything. Is that answering? Sorry, my can you say that? That's that's clearly? what that's what I'm asking. Yes. Well, Just say it again. If section 74.3 does not apply, yeah. then on the point raised in our respondent's notice, the Consumer Rights Act point doesn't add anything. Yeah, thank you. There is, however, when you are particularly bearing in mind that you have, the court has indicated that it will uh, carry out an assessment, we do say that the Consumer Rights Act and the consideration of fair and unfair terms in relation to that has a bearing upon an assessment of fair costs. But that has to be within the core exclusion, doesn't it? I'm sorry, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't hear well. has to be within the core exclusion, I mean, it's actually classic. Well, then... In section 64.1b. Well, then the question is, is whether it, it's uh, uh, transparent. So, um, if uh, I am saying, if as a solicitor, I am saying to the client, my fees are estimated at £2,500, you will recover part or all of those from the other side. That, in our submission, is not transparent, because that is not telling the client. Mm. But it's not answering the wrong question, isn't it? The question is whether it's transparent as to what they're going to charge. Well, once it's once you get into the core exclusion, because you're assessing what is fair, right? As to the charges, the question is whether the charges are fair, not whether it's and whether the, their charges are transparent, which is within the core exclusion, not whether some ancillary information is transparent. Mm. I mean, this is the most torturous argument, I mean, great respect, Mr. Kirby. Um, a, it goes beyond your respondent's notice. B, um, it applies to an assessment of costs of £299.50. And it is absolutely plain that in deciding what is fair, without the Consumer Rights Act, one can take into account um, all matters all the circumstances of the case, and particularly that your client was not told the two points. So you don't need the Consumer Rights Act for that. Well, I, uh, uh, I, I don't need it um, in the sense of uh, I accept that those points can be made in relation to an assessment of fairness of, of uh, the cost. And I don't think Mr Williams would say anything else. I mean, the... the, the the, the district judge took into account those points on the legal basis he acted. Mr Justice Lavender took into account those points on the legal basis.
basis he acted upon. But um, I don't think anybody's saying we shouldn't decide what is fair once we've determined what the legal basis is. Yes. But the CRA is, you know, the CRA is a very complicated piece of legislation, to be honest. I mean, I did spend a year of my life arguing about it. Um, it's, it really doesn't add anything, as I say, to the meaning of the word fair. Um, does it? I should have added. The, the <laughs> does it? <laughs> does it? The way in which it has recently been considered in the—I um, hesitate to say this—in uh, the um, uh, uh, ECJ uh, happened to be with regard to uh, a contract with regard to um, lawyers' fees um, and uh, Czechoslovakia. Sorry. Was it Czechoslovakia? No, they were Seville in, in Spain. Spain. Um, an interesting thing about it is that, um, how the uh, 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 procedure there for assessing um, barristers' fees uh, is dealt with in a matter of about 10 days, I think, um, which is referred to in the um, uh, uh, judgment. But the case, which actually is in the bundle, um, does actually... Uh, make clear that references to, um, uh, in that case, the Seville Bar's standard costs, um, which would could be available, um, was not um, sufficient. Um, and here, that in this case, there is no reference to the fixed cost. There is no reference to what they are. There is no click on here to go through to the uh, uh, relevant. Um, uh, section in uh, part 46, there is simply nothing. My Lord, um, I'm conscious in the light of what my Lord has said and to a large extent what I have uh, agreed to, um, that uh, my Lord won't want me to take a very long. But it does shorten things because the reality is that I mean, you, 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 may have, have, you may have been seeing which way the wind is blowing in this case, but the wind is not blowing um, in the direction of saying that it is fair uh, that the solicitors should not tell you what the fixed recoverable costs are and then be allowed to actually charge thousands of pounds more, five times the amount, um, on an assessment, so <laughs> the, you may be thinking you're you're not doing very well on one or two legal points, but on the those factual points, um, this this you know it is it is obvious that that is not fair if you don't tell her um, what the real position is that you can then come in with a massive bill of um, uh, you know. Large, much, much more than you 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 would ever get from the other side. And you wouldn't need the Consumer Rights Act for that. You don't need the Consumer Rights Act because that is all in the word fair, and I would suggest probably in the word reasonable. Precisely. Well, um, but which that's is not this, that's not this case. Though, is it? No, it, 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 well, it on is. the co on, well, it is this case in one sense, but yeah. it's, but in in terms of the, of the fairness of the costs charged, which is where, where as I understand it. Then um, that doesn't necessarily help. Well, I, w I won't take it further. If I could mm. impertinently treat my lord the master of the law, uh, Ross, uh, tail. I have, no, I haven't picked up on this at all. Uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. Just before you leave it, can I go back to a question, that my lord chancellor? If you were to do a CRA exercise, what the CRA does is it enables you to say a term of a contract is not binding. No. And you were asked which term is not binding. And you said it's the term which says we can charge you more than we recover from the other side. Yes. But if that's right, then, then they're limited to the 500 pounds, aren't they? Yes. 
because you, you've accepted that, 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 as I understand it, you've accepted that, that um, they can charge more than the £500 because you've accepted the success fee, is, that, which I think is 15% of £500. Yeah. Yes, I understand. £75 can be, you can ask the client for that. Well, well, my lord, we, um, uh, my lord, we we have accepted that. Can I? But my lord has raised an important point that I need to deal with in relation to the success fee. Um, uh, we haven't, uh, we didn't obviously challenge the decision of the district judge with regard to fifteen percent. But my lord, the reason for that is that the CFA provided for a success fee of a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, which we challenged, and what was allowed was the 15%, which was provided for in Herbert, where a client hasn't given informed approval to a success fee. So, oh. so that was. But did I understand? At least according to Mr. Um, Williams's note, that before the district judge, it was agreed that the success fee should be 15%. Yes. Because so, so, so because that was never Herbert. an issue before the courts. It may have been an issue earlier, but before the judge, before the district judge, the district judge, according to this, awarded this. It's, it says, at first instance, that's before Judge Bellamy. Parties agreed the success fee should be fifteen percent of the recoverable base cost. D DJ Bellamy assessed the reasonable base cost at one thousand three hundred ninety-two plus VAT. And then Lavender, Mr. Justice Lavender, overturned that decision. Allowed base costs of 500, that's the fixed cost recoverable from the other side, plus a success fee of 75%, that's 15%. And that that wasn't, as my Lord says, that, that's been accepted. So you accept that, you, that they were entitled to 575 plus VAT? Well, we, we've accepted that they were entitled to a success fee. And you've accepted the quantum of it? Yeah. Well, no. No, my lord, um, uh, I, I've got uh, various people trying to give me instructions from, from behind uh, in relation to that. The people, um, uh, my instructing solicitor actually dealt with the uh, detailed assessments, and we can go through, if it's going to be necessary, we can go through the but I, I'm, not, I'm not really concerned about the success fee. What I'm concerned about is which is the term of the contract which you say is unenforceable. It can't just be, as you said, you can't recover more from, from the clan than you've got from the other side because you accept that you can recover more in the shape of the success fee than you get from the other side. It has to be a more nuanced term. It has to be a term that you can recover more by way of base costs than you recover by way of, from the clan than you recover by way of fixed costs from the other side. Is that, is that right? Well, if one goes to the CFA itself, Yes. You can recover, yeah. I mean, this illustrates the difference, as, as, as the Master Rules has pointed out, between what the Consumer Rights Act does, which it strikes down terms, and what an assessment does on a fair basis, which enables the court to set the level of recovery at whatever it thinks is the fair level of recovery. And, and it is your argument, must be your argument under the CRA, that it enables the court, obliges the court, if you're right, to strike down the entire term saying, we can recover from you more by way of base costs than you, you get from the other side. Is that right? My Lord, yes. I mean, if I can go to the actual term. Yeah. Um, my Lord, page 334 of the core bundle, so the original bundle. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is the paying us if you win. If you win your claim, you pay our basic charges, our expenses and disbursements, and a success fee together with the premium for any insurance you take out. You're entitled to seek recovery from your opponent of part or all of our basic charges and our expenses and disbursements, but not the success fee uh, or any insurance uh, premium. 
So we have not challenged the fact that we are required um, to pay a success fee and that we cannot uh, recover that from uh, the other side. The terms and conditions which starts at 346 Yeah. At 17, there are the charges agreed between us may exceed the cost recoverable from another party. This means that in practice there may be a portion, sorry, a proportion of your costs which you will have to bear yourself irrespective of any order for costs which may be made against the opposing party uh, or parties. Um, and uh, further down at 19, you will be liable to pay <coughs> these disbursements and that in accordance with these terms and conditions irrespective of whether an order for cost is made against the other party mm. or parties and whether you're able to recover any costs uh, mm. from your uh, opponents. Um, my Lord, reading those together uh, we say that the term that is unfair because it's not sufficiently transparent is that um, we will have to pay uh, uh, effectively the excess, but we have accepted in the other term that we were told about the success fee. I'm looking at page 340. Here, which Sorry, 340, which is the Law Society Conditions, and has a section dealing with costs if you win. And the third one is, if we can't agree the amount, the court will decide. If it doesn't cover all our basic charges and our expenses disbursements, then you pay the difference. That's yeah. really what you're attacking. Well, the problem with that clause, of course, is that's simply false. Um, so far as um, uh, because the court doesn't make a decision court doesn't at make all, a because decision. it's automatic. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so I mean, that's just, I'm afraid, an illustration of um, the um, we would say the, the misleading nature of, of the information that's given. But but I think I understand the way you put it. But yeah. You, so you do say under the CRA limb of the argument, the effect is you can't recover more by way of basic costs than the five hundred pounds. Yes, but that's why I prefaced um, my answer earlier yes. with reference to what our respondents notice. Yes, exactly. No, I understand. Thank you. Mm. I think it does illustrate how un, um, fle inflexible the act is compared to an assessment <coughs> on a fair basis. Well, fairness is obviously a term that, that um, uh, is open to the court to take into account uh, what it will. Uh, which, my lord, brings me on to addressing you with regard to fairness um, in the light because, of what my lord said earlier. Because the interesting thing about fairness is that let's assume you succeed in maintaining a limitation to base costs of £500. Um, all these other questions really don't go to the level of the success fee. And you accept that you have to pay a success fee. Well, we, we, so the best you can get, really, out of this is 500 plus what Mr Justice Lavender always said. Yes, 500 plus the success fee plus the disbursement. Fee. And since it was agreed at 15% of costs ordered... So it's 15% of the 500, yes. 15% of the 500. Um, no, since it was agreed at 15%, before D.J. Bellamy, and then ordered at 15% of 500 by Mr. Justice Lavender, you probably can't improve on that. Well, I can't improve on 15%, no. no. Um, and, and all this stuff about fairness only goes to the 500, and Mr. Williams is not saying that those costs should be assessed above 500, I don't think, maybe. No, that's right. I, I'm, I'm saying that we should get back the 200 and... Yes, exactly. You're saying he top. should get. He, he is arguing for a bigger success fee, uh, namely the no, 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 no. no it's basic charges. Um, I mean, or the success fee would increase mathematically because if the basic charges that is applied as a percentage of the basic charges, so if the basic charges are increased, then it's fifteen percent of the larger number. Can I but, can I, can I so, try and just understand this? Yes. Um, 
you had you had charged the 500 plus 321.25, forget the VAT. Yes. The 321.25 was actually um, the success fee that you had originally yes. charged. That's right, isn't it? A and, some basic, and, and, and a small amount of basic charges. 25 of general damages and yes. sundries. There was some sundry. Forget the sundry. So that was um, leaving the VAT out of account, 821.25. And the judge, the district judge, said that the reasonable base costs that he assessed were 13.92. Correct. So he said, you're entitled to charge the 821 by definition because it was because less it's smaller. than 13.92. Correct. Which was fair and reasonable, etc. And what, what Mr. Justice Lambda did was to say, oh no, you can only recover the 500 as base costs, and therefore you can only recover 75 percent, 15%, which is 15 percent of the base cost. Yes. So, what so that's I'm, where you get to. But what you're what you're seeking to do here before this court is to say, in effect, I'm entitled to the 821.25 plus VAT. I'm entitled precisely, and that is a, a mixture of basic charges and success fee. Of yeah, which the success fee element is not contested. So, just to go back to my lord and master of the roles, we are seeking a small the the the, 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 the increase over the basic um, charges which the district judge allowed. Yeah. Um, the interparty page of the district judge allowed, in which Mr. Justice Lambda knocked back off again. And I'm afraid the figures are really quite hard to pin down precisely because as soon as you change the basic charges, you change the success fee because one is just a function of the other. Um, but on Mr. Justice Lavender's uh, um, figures, the success fee is the £75. If, 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 um, uh, um, so so it, um, there it is. So it is an argument about basic charges. And with, with, with very great respect to my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Nugi, in my reply, I was going to identify that very passage page 340, as that must be the clause that Mr. Kirby is really trying to say is contractually unenforceable, even though Mr. Kirby himself didn't actually identify it. But, but, but it, it must be that clause. So which clause? The, the clause which my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent just put. Well, the court will decide how much you can recover if the amount doesn't cover all our basic You charges. pay the difference. You pay the difference. You pay the difference. That's the one that you... So that's and I mean, one. that's expressed in different ways in, in different, different places. places. But that's the sort of quite, and certainly in terms of this case, it's wider significance. And that is the standard law society term, a term that is, it's no exaggeration to say, has appeared in millions of CFAs uh, since the year 2000 when the law society first promulgated its model. And Mr. Holland, I see, is nodding agreement. Okay. Well, okay. Right. Now, Mr. Kirby, um, you say, and here you may think you're cantering to a finish. Um, you say, this is all jolly unfair because they didn't tell me what they should have told me under their professional duties. Um, I, the client, couldn't know, um, couldn't make a proper decision about what I was going to be doing without knowing that if the case settled at stage two, I'd only get £500 and I was agreeing to be signed up to a lot. So the base costs ought to be £500. Yes. As a matter of fairness in this case. Yes, in the no, not any other. Um, and you say um, that takes into account all the things, the duties that we've discussed, and you would say by duty duties, whether the court agrees with you about that, it can certainly agree with you about paragraph 8.6 and 8.7 of the code. Um, and then you say, as regards the success fee, it was agreed at 15% of the base costs, and if the court assesses the base costs at £500 as a matter of fairness, Mr Justice Lavender was right. And that's the position even if it's non-contentious. Yeah. So non-contentious assessment, with taking account of the principle of fairness, gets you to what Mr Justice Lavender was. Well, yes, because I'm not, I'm not appealing against what no. no, no, no. So so we're just simply asking. So I'm just putting. I'm not. I'm not wanting less. I'm not wanting to get more of it. No, no, no. I'm yeah. not you are. I mean, you you may lose. Therefore, I mean, I'm postulating a possibility. Every legal point in the case that win the appeal. Correct. Right. Subject to what Mr. Williams has got to say. Well, of course. Um, just before I come on to dealing with. I wonder if I could just make one point in the light of um, 
and, and I fully understand why, why the phrase was used by my Lord uh, the Chancellor. Um, when the costs were assessed uh, by um, uh, by um, Justice uh, Lavender, um, they at that stage the costs had been assessed throughout on the basis they were contentious costs. I, d I don't think there's been any. Uh, uh, dispute about that. Uh, well, they were, the, there's certainly never been any reference to uh, the solicitor's non contentious uh, business remuneration. No, no, he was obviously assessing contentious costs. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, in Carriage, um, where there was reference yesterday uh, to the decision of a um, uh, Regional Cost Judge Bellamy. Mm -hmm. uh, in Caritage, they were also assessed um, uh, as contentious costs and not with reference to uh, the solicitor's non contentious business remuneration order. And that's confirmed just um, for my uh, Lord's notes uh, at paragraph 84 on page 1230 of Miss Justice Lavender's decision in SGI Legal and Heritage, where he said, Mr. Kirby referred in his submissions to the Solicitor's Non-Contentious Business Remuneration Order 2009, but the District Judge did not base his decision on that order, and even the late Respondent's notice did not include an allegation that the District Judge's decision should be upheld on the basis of that order. So there was, um, uh, uh, lest there be a suggestion that um, uh, District Judge Bellamy Heritage came to this, the same view, you know, when they were whether they were reasonable, whether they were fair and reasonable. He was not addressed with regard to the solicitor's non-contentious business remuneration order. Okay. Right. So, my lord, I, um, I think what I have to do now, I'm afraid, is uh, address the court as briefly as I can with regard to the points that could be raised were this court to be in the lucky position, which it is, of assessing a bill of this size um, in uh, a portal case where this court were to make that decision, having found that it is non-contentious business. Mm -hmm. um, and my Lord, the first argument that uh, uh, could be run, and, and indeed we, we put forward, is, well, in which case is the CFA in this case a non-contentious business agreement because um, it is <coughs> uh, the court would have found that this was non-contentious business uh, and uh, if it is a non-contentious business agreement and there's no uh, uh, um, suggestion in it that says this is not a non-contentious business agreement only this is not a contentious business agreement then if it was a non-contentious uh, business agreement, it is open to uh, Ms. Belsner to, pursuant to section um, 57, section 57 of the Solicitor's Act, is on page uh, 7 of, <coughs> uh, of the statutory materials box. a non-contentious business agreement, you'll see at 57.5, if on any assessment of costs the agreement is relied on by the solicitor and objected to by the client as unfair or unreasonable, the costs
costs officer may inquire into the facts and certify them to the court. And if from that certificate it appears just to the court that the agreement should be set aside or the amount payable under it reduced, the court may so order and may give such consequential directions as it thinks fit. So the first matter that the court would have to do... Isn't this dealing with a scenario where you've got a non-contentious business agreement within Section 57, Subsection 2, which provides, for example, for the payment of a gross sum or for an hourly rate or a commission or whatever. And the client goes for an assessment of the cost and the solicitor relies on the non-contentious business agreement and says, no, no, you shouldn't assess the cost because I'm entitled to be paid £10,000 because that's what was agreed. And what Subsection 5 is saying is if that comes up in an assessment, the tax, the cost judge can say, no, this is not fair and reasonable. But it's not... You can't sort of turn this into a non-contentious business agreement, can you? Well, if you look at Hollins and Russell, the Court of Appeal found that to be a contentious business agreement. Right. It's not in the bundle. There's a case called Healy's. Is there a definition anywhere? Of what? Of non-contentious business agreement. 57.1. Well, 57.1. Just within 57.1, is it? Yeah. And they can't... Is it an agreement that fixes the amount of money the solicitor's entitled to under the... So I'm standing up because my law's looking at me. No, because 57.2 says an agreement may provide for remuneration of the solicitor by a gross sum and then by amendments that have been inserted or by reference to an hourly rate. So it doesn't... So you can have a non-contentious agreement. But, I mean, just so it's clear while I'm on my feet, as you'll remember, Mr. Kirby took some time yesterday showing you that the agreement covered court proceedings. And in the end, I stood up and said, if Mr. Kirby's trying to persuade you that this agreement would have covered contentious business if there had been any, then that is conceded. And Mr. Kirby thanked me. But notwithstanding my concession, therefore, the agreement was an agreement that covered contentious business. Mr. Kirby is now arguing it's a contentious business agreement, a non-contentious business agreement. And I do... I would invite him to address the point as to how that can possibly reconcile with all those terms he took you through yesterday. That is one of the... In our submission, that's one of the difficulties that my learned friend faces. Well, but we've got the point. I think you have... You say this is a non-contentious business... It could be a non-contentious business agreement. And therefore, you're entitled to say that the terms you object to are not fair and reasonable. And it could be set aside. Right, so that's the first point. But it could be set aside following... And I'm not going to suggest that I want to do this. But when determining whether to set aside, that is often a matter that is dealt with following evidence being exchanged between the parties as to whether it's fair and reasonable. There's some... Bob Burden case referred to in the authorities, which was a non-contentious business agreement, where there was a trial over two or three days, I think, with evidence as to whether it was unfair or unreasonable. But that is a point that would have been open to the client to take. My lord, so far as unfairness is concerned... Suppose it's not a non-contentious business agreement. What is the position then? If it's not a non-contentious business agreement, then it is not a contentious business agreement. It is, I assume, a retainer that's intended to cover both. Yeah, it's just a retainer. Yes, but what is the power of the court to inquire into the fairness of the remuneration of business? Well, the court... The entitlement to inquire into the fairness is obviously because that's the test under the non-contentious remuneration order. Where do we find the non-contentious remuneration order? That is... At divider... Forgive me, I keep missing... Oh, that's at divider 38 in the... 
um, the statutory materials bundle. I'm grateful to my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Nugent because I should have taken it this, first of all. So this, this deals with um, assessment of costs in relation to non-contentious visitors. Must, have, must be fair and reasonable having regard to all the circumstances of the case. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, my Lord might note in, in passing that um, uh, clause two that um, <coughs> uh, cost means the amount charged on a solicitor's bill exclusive of disbursements and value added tax in respect of non contentious business. So it would appear that on a non contentious business um, uh, assessment, you can't actually challenge uh, the disbursements. Um, that would obviously be a matter of concern if a solicitor, for instance, was incurring disbursements at a level greater than those allowed uh, uh, under the fixed cost regime. I'm not suggesting that was the case here, uh, but it is uh, uh, an interesting point uh, in passing. But, um, my Lord, yes, uh, paragraph three is the relevant paragraph. Must be fair and reasonable having regard to all the circumstances in the case. Uh, and in particular, and then it sets out a uh, number of factors, including um, obviously the amount or value of any money or property involved. Um, and at little i, and here the word is different, the approval, express or implied, of the entitled person or the express approval of the testator to the sister undertaking or any part of the work giving rise to the cost or the amount of the cost. Um, so we would say that uh, approval should mean informed approval but we also say that uh, fair and reasonable the use of the word fair must add something to reasonable because if it was just reasonableness what is the point um, of using um, uh, the term unfair. Does this mean we don't need to decide if it's a non-contentious business agreement? If, if we're satisfied it's non-contentious business, either it's a non-contentious business agreement, in which case section 757.5 imposes a test of unfair or unreasonable, or it's not, in which case it's article 3 of the solicitor's remuneration order, does, does the same. You will, you will be back to determining simply what the fair amount is. Yes. So do we need to decide if it's a non-contentious business? Does it make any difference to your case? Um, I don't think it does, okay. on reflection. Thank you. I was just struck by one of the materials we were shown earlier, which said that non Business agreements are now very rare, and, and the Law Society recommends not using them. But, um, which, whereas I think your argument was pretty well everything a solicitor does in non-contentious business would be a, a non-contentious business agreement. Well, it, 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 it That's could. That's why be. I asked if there was a definition in there because I had in mind precisely that point. Because you seem to be saying, well, this agreement will, as it were, become a non-contentious business agreement if you're. If, if Mr. Williams is right about section 743, uh, which would suggest that, um, given that this is a test case, there'd be a whole raft of instances where agreements become non contentious business agreements, even though it's apparently a very rare beast. Well, it, uh, part of the problem here is that the courts have some. Uh, problem is the wrong word. Um, that the courts have on occasion said. Look at this solicitor's retainer. Does it tick the boxes that are required um, uh, for the definition of a contentious business agreement or a non-contentious business agreement? Um, whatever you choose to call it, if it falls into, uh, has those characteristics as set out in the Solicitors Act, 
then whether you call it a contentious business agreement or a non-contentious business agreement, it is what it is. You know, the old sort of a four-pronged instrument for, for digging is a fork even if you call it a spade. Five-pronged instrument. It, it, that. Yes, but I've never seen a five-pronged spade that's, which is, uh, fork. Which is a... That's what Lord Justice Stalkin pointed out in a subsequent case. <laughs> that Lord Temple was wrong when he said there was a five-pronged implement because most garden forks have four prongs at times. Now, Mr. Kirby, um, just trying to get back to this case, um, you've now accepted that whether it is a non-contentious business agreement or not doesn't matter. Uh, the question is, what is fair? Um, I think I've given you a pretty fair indication, speaking only for myself anyway, um, uh, what is fair by way of base costs would seem to be what you weren't told. Um, which is what you'd recover from the other side. Had you been told, it might have been different. Um, so we are actually arguing, as I said about half an hour ago, about what is fair for a success fee. But since you've agreed 15% for the district judge as being the right figure for the success fee, and since and if the, the base costs were 500, you can't do better than that. What else do we need to take into account in your submission in deciding what is fair? Because I, hope, I, I, I detect that you're trying to get us to go into the principles of accessing, assessing costs on the basis of what is fair and reasonable and deliver some magisterial judgment on that question for the benefit of cost judges up and down the land. But I fear you may be disappointed on that because those questions are not pleaded. They're not in anybody's notice of appeal or respondent's notice. It's mm. not what we're here to do. And as my Lord, the Chancellor, said, I think yesterday and probably today, perhaps several times, um, this case is about principles, but we don't want to send it back to the cost judge, not because we don't like the cost judge or don't think that he's the most expert person to do this question, but because we're talking about two hundred and ninety nine pounds and fifty pence. And in a question about two hundred and ninety nine pounds and fifty pence, the legal questions having been determined, um, what is fair and what is not fair is within a very small compass and would normally be dealt with by the district judge in one line. And you may be disappointed to hear that it may be dealt with in one line by this court. So yeah. Uh, what I'm now asking is, how much more argument do you want to address to what is fair? When you've shown us the order, we know what we're doing. Uh, we've got the parameters of the case. Um, surely well, well, we're done. Aren't well, we? obviously, I I would be quite content, if uh, delighted, in fact, if this court found that the fair remuneration was the base costs of five hundred pounds. But we're from Mr. Well, we're going to hear from. But, uh, but the, the the real question. The, the, yeah, so I've got to follow that point, but the district judge said that, that the reason that the recoverable base costs were um, 1,392. I think that's what he said. 1,392. Which was more than the yes. solicitor charge. And the question is he did that on the basis that it was contentious business because it's reasonable. What does the fair and what on the basis of fair and reasonable for non-contentious? What what other arguments are there for su suggesting that the thirteen ninety two was not fair and reasonable, other than the ones you've addressed to us, which are effectively a rerun of all your other arguments? In other words, saying because the, we didn't get all the information, I, I paraphrase before we, we did because we didn't get all the information. This because the client didn't get all the information. This wasn't fair and reasonable. What else is there? What? Is there some special magic in what cost judges do that this court doesn't understand or can't understand or whatever? Not you suggested magic, earlier cost that judges, cost judges that, are that right not relevant for these submissions. Yeah. Um, uh, right. well, um, uh, obviously, I would be repeating the points that I have made. Yeah. So if it can be taken as read uh, that when it comes to fairness, uh, I am in addition submitting in relation to this point, the points that I've made previously about the client not being told about the recoverable costs 
um, that recoverable costs are sums that are supposed to be reasonable in relation uh, to these matters, uh, that the client was therefore not told that uh, the actual cost estimate was five times uh, the amount that would be uh, recovered, that she was therefore at risk of paying disproportionately high um, uh, amounts of costs. Uh, yes, all, all those points, uh, again, um, uh, uh, I uh, repeat. And um, you said that that was there to be treated as, as being advanced in addition, but I think my Lord's point, that is actually your case. I mean, the, the, you don't challenge the assessment of what was reasonable. And if you were just looking at the amount of time spent on the charging rate and so on, the 1,392, you've, you've never challenged that as, no, no. As, a, as, a, as an assessment of what's reasonable. So your only point is, well, however reasonable it is, it's not fair to charge me, and you didn't tell me. That's it. That's, no, no. It is one point. I mean, that is it. And is it? Well, I think we understand that. Um, and I did say in opening yesterday that this case is not about the reasonableness of a solicitor's no, no. cost. And, and, and the argument against you would be, well, yes, of course, you could in theory have charged 2,500, but actually all we're talking about is another 200 pounds on. And it's not unfair for the client to pay a bit more than they've recovered. That's Because they always knew that. Yeah. I mean, they were told you might have to pay more when you recover it. And when we're talking about £200, what's unfair about that? That's, that's and, and your case is a very stark one, but you didn't, you didn't tell us. You didn't spell it out. You didn't spell it out. And so you can't have anything. That, that, that's it. You didn't spell it out. You could have spelled it out. And you were obliged to spell it out, certainly in, in terms of your regulatory yeah. duties. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you had a... Obviously, we know that at the end of the day, they only charge whatever it was. Um, uh, but the unfairness um, is, is that uh, the client was not told uh, about uh, the level of um, uh, fixed costs and did not have um, the opportunity of, of uh, therefore, making a decision with regard to that. But now we're on, I accept, onto the question of the assessment. Um, and so. Yes, I do repeat what I've yeah. said, yeah. said okay. earlier. Um, <clears throat> I, I, but there are a couple of other points. Uh, they're not magic, but there are a couple of other points. Uh, one is that one of the matters that uh, can be taken into account with regard to fairness is uh, uh, matters such as the uh, length, complexity, and lack of clarity of documentation generally. The inaccuracy of statements, I suppose that is a point I have uh, made uh, previously. Can I take you to one authority, if I may? Um, and that is uh, a decision of the senior cost judge uh, in Ville Barrage, which is page 1024, I think. Which bundle? Uh, the third, I think. On all the yeah. Cool. Bill Barrage, I think, is how you pronounce that. Divide us 39. 39. Yep. Uh, this was um, uh, 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 an assessment and the judge had to consider um, fairness uh, and uh, unreasonableness. Can I just check one point? Um, and I should make clear that what was being challenged here was a contentious business agreement in the form of a CFA, because as I said in Hollins, Court of Appeal said that a CFA is a CBA, and in seeking to set aside the CFA slash CBA, this is the decision on that. So it's, it's not considering uh, fairness and reasonableness under the non-contentious business remuneration order, but it's the same principles with regard to 
uh, fairness and unreasonableness. So, so um, which paragraph you... 1029 uh, starts the section uh, with regard to uh, unfairness. Yeah, what, no, sorry, what, paragraph 23, sorry. What point is there in this judgment that goes beyond the submissions you've already made? Uh, the, the point, um, if I could take you to um, paragraph 25, obviously it's fact fact specific, but uh, those there are some of the examples of um, uh, the reasons why the agreement was unfair, because the client wasn't taken through it. There's no attendance note. Paragraph 26. Uh, the complicated nature of it. Not, 27 need to be relevant because they're not challenged. Well, 20, obviously there wasn't a risk assessment in this matter either. And that 100% was simply applied. What I find interesting about this judgment is um, that he treats fairness and reasonableness separately. Yes. Yeah. And, the, and the assessment of fairness is, is effectively, did the client fully understand and appreciate it? Yes. And, and having concluded the client didn't, he says it's unfair. Yeah. <coughs> Unfortunately, you didn't put any evidence about your client's sophistication. My Lord, I think I'm going to utter the magic words unless I can assist you further. So it's our submission. Yeah. <laughs> Very well. Um, thank you. No, no more questions for you, Mr. No. Cabby. Many no. thanks. Um, Mr. Mr. Holland, do you want to say anything? Just very briefly, because of the wide-ranging discussion, it's simply this. Um, if you look at uh, Section 57.5 of the Solicitors Act in relation to challenging non-contentious business agreements, mm -hmm. if on any assessment of costs the agreement is relied upon by a sister and objected to by the client as unfair and unreasonable, now, as I read that, the assessment is whether the agreement itself is unfair or unreasonable. If you then look at, and if it is, you're thrown back on a general assessment of costs. That's the point. Well, does, that, does, that that's mean, the does that mean in assessing whether it's unfair and unreasonable, you look at the 2,500 which could have been charged rather than the 200 which was, 800 which was? Yes, you, you, yes. you look at the circumstances of the agreement. Was I, I suppose you look backwards at but it's the agreement. Is the agreement unfair? Now, because because the point about these non-contentious business agreements is if the agreement is upheld, that, that's it. There's nothing left yeah. to assess. So there's oh. no assessment. No. So? That's right, isn't it? So, so whether it's done by saying you will pay £10,000 or whether it's done by saying my hourly rate yes. is £500 and you will pay it for however many hours I do, if you get to the, the end of it and you've done... 20 hours, you, it's, it, it's um, £10,000, and the solicitor says, right, you owe me £10,000. The client can challenge that by going to an assessment, and on the assessment he says, the solicitor relies on this agreement, but it's not fair and reasonable. That's right. The, it, and if the court says it's not fair and reasonable, then there has to be a, a, a assessment. And an then assessment. you then, yeah, yeah, it's just pointing out, well, it may be a, it's a technical point, but if you then go to the Solicitor's Non-Contentious Business Remuneration Order 2009, which we just yep. looked at, um, what is a, a, a solicitor's costs must be fair and reasonable, having regard to all the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it's necessity under the 2009 order, it's the costs which must be fair and reasonable. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily looking at the terms of the agreement. And costs are defined means the amount charged in mm. sister's bill exclusive of dispersion. So yeah. it, it, it may be... Well, can I ask you the same question I asked Mr. Covey? Does it matter? Do we need to know, decide, whether this arrangement, assuming it's non-contentious business at all, is a non-contentious business agreement? I, I don't think you do, because I don't think... I'll leave it to Mr. Williams. I don't think Mr. Williams' client has ever sought to say that it was. It's a, 
as, as I understand it, the, the, the effect is, as, as, uh, as the Chancellor lawyer. says, yeah. good assessment. The solicitor says, no, 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 here's my agreement. You agreed to pay me £10,000. So well, I've read, well, I've read it's fair or it's not. And if, it's, yeah. if, if it's not fair, then, then you're the, into the remuneration. Then you're into the remuneration, and then it's the costs that have to be yes. fair and reasonable. Yeah. Now, it may be that as part of that, you might look at the understanding of, of the client in respect of the costs, and you, but you then look at, well, what costs are actually being charged? Yes. And yeah. you know, even if it might have been unfair and unreasonable to charge the full amount, if what has actually been charged is fair and reasonable, that's the end of it. And whether the agreement itself. Yeah. And going back to my Lord Lord Justice Newsy's point, if if at that stage, what you what the district judge was looking at was the fairness and reasonableness of the eight hundred and twenty one pounds twenty five. That's right. Eight hundred twenty one pounds twenty five. As I understand it, the point is that the the district judge assess the costs and indeed was invited by the respondent to assess the costs on the basis that they were contentious costs, therefore he applies the CPR. If this court finds in fact they were non-contentious costs then the district judge technically applied the wrong lens. He, he should have been looking at the 2009 order. Now whether as a matter of fact that makes any difference at all to what the outcome is, it's, it's not a, 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 a we've addressed you on the basis that the learning is that it doesn't actually make practically any difference. But whether it does on this is not a matter which the society... No, and, but it might make a difference because um, uh, the word fair is different from the word reasonable and the, the district judge was looking at whether the base costs were reasonable. Yes. Came to the conclusion that what they'd actually charged, 831, was reasonable because the base costs would have been more than that reasonably. Yes. Uh, but was not addressing himself, I think, to the question he, he actually did address himself first to the question of fully informed consent, then decided that fully informed consent was not necessary. So he didn't really address the fairness issue um, as uh, Master Gordon Sager did in um, yeah. the case we just that, looked at. Well, that's a different... Uh, but, and, and Mr Kirby says, well, um, had he done so, he would have taken into account all these points that I made earlier. Yes, but uh, and uh, we've got to decide the answer to that, and we we need to hear Mr. Williams on that. I'm grateful to that. Yeah. Uh, yes, may I please your lordships? How long do you need to be, Mr. Williams? Oh, well, I'll certainly be finished by lunchtime, I would hope, and, and, unless unless no pun intended, you tax me very heavily. <laughs> and all I can say is that will come as music to the ears of the court. Well, I shall um, do my best to, um, to, to meet that. So, so far as, um, if I'm just going to begin with some observations about CAM Legal, my client, and the, the funding documents, because it's obvious that they have caused the court some disquiet. Um, and let me, um, um, and when I addressed you in chief, I hadn't had the opportunity, obviously, to take instructions on some of the concerns the court was, court, court was expressing, and, and I have since. It is not part of our case that our client care documents for this period of our commercial activity uh, um, were, um, were, were satisfactory. The client care documents, a very different question as to whether my, my class actual business conduct was satisfactory, but we accept um, that um, uh, um, it wasn't satisfactory. And we don't have any hesitation in, in conceding that if we had attempted to charge uh, um, um, this client uh, £2,500, or even uh, um, uh, uh, £1,500 in all likelihood, uh, 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 um, then there would be serious questions as to the reasonableness, let alone uh, the, the, um, the fairness of that. But obviously you appreciate um, that um, the position in this case is that we didn't do those things. And essentially we say, insofar as the client might have, been, might have been entitled to any remedy, it's a remedy that was already completely freely volunteered when we uh, took the, the charges we took from her. Uh, so in, in other words, she has already had or, or, or any remedy to which she was entitled and she's had it voluntarily from solicitors who, if they're not going to get a gold star for their paperwork, uh, certainly don't deserve any sort of disparagement uh, for the way in which they actually treated their client. Um, and, and, and in accepting that the documents were unsatisfactory, um, can I also um, say, say this? I do respectfully remind the court that we are looking at a period of some seven years ago. Maybe seven years ago these, these documents were, were, were entered into. Um, I'm instructed that since May 2018, CAM Legal has had an overall contractual cap where they, 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 they do do what, in essence, I think this court um, might say that they ought to have done, which is they just say to us at the outset, uh, you, 
you are liable for a shortfall on our costs, but only up to 25% of your compensation. And according to Mr. Carlyle's evidence, uh, um, 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 which is in the bundle, uh, um, uh, so supplemental bundle page 291, I don't ask you to turn it up, but supplemental 291, Mr. Carlyle's evidence is that uh, it's obviously um, just a snapshot of what his firm sees, and obviously his firm is only going to see uh, those cases where clients are unhappy, uh, because they're the ones who are going to have gone to check my legal fees or have been tracked down by check my legal fees or however check my legal fees do it. But even in that subsection of, of clients who ex hypothesize are, are dissatisfied with your solicitors, 85% of those clients have got CFAs that are subject to an overall contractual cap. So that does seem to be um, the um, way in which the profession is now is, operating. Is that the 84.67%? That's it, my Lord. And, and in fact, if you look at the next column, You'll see the, the, the his his evidence the is that the average is 25.65%. Yeah. That neat, yeah. that sort of segues in or would segue in very neatly to the observations made by, by Lord Lord Justice Nuji about um, what would be the position in damages. Uh, because because the evidence is uh, that um that, that in fact out in the market most solicitors are charging more than this solicitor charged. Um, um, I, I, to the extent it's, it, it's relevant, the, 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 we've accepted there's a regrettable disconnect between what their documents said and what their practices actually were. We do um, invite the court uh, to have in mind, uh, uh, um, if any criticism is to be made, um, that this is a small firm of three solicitors practicing in a small market town, and it's simply a case of it not updating its documents to keep track of its actual commercial practice. Um, and, and we do say by way of mitigation. And Ms. Belsner herself, in our submission, was treated fairly throughout and saw a deduction from her damages which was modest and which must have been fully in keeping with her own reasonable expectations. And in that respect, and, and in saying it now, I won't need to say it again when I come on to the question of fairness, um, I remind the court she was expressly advised that there would be deductions. She's expressly advised that for the success fee alone, the deduction might be as much as 25%, and she's given specific illustrations of that. Um, um, and even though she's not giving um, illustrations of other deductions, the deductions which are actually made uh, are well within the parameters of the deduction she was warned about for success fee alone. It's, 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 as we know, it's 20%, not 25%. Um, it's been repeatedly noticed that Ms. Belsner has not put any evidence, but even Check My Legal Fees speaking on her behalf have never asserted that the deduction of some basic <coughs> charges from her damages came as any sort of surprise. The closest we get um, is from the points of dispute which they filed in the county court. And what they said in the points of dispute was that Ms. Belsner had a reasonable expectation that the third party would be required to pay most, if not all, of the basic costs. Um, and I'll ask Mr. McDonald to give me the reference to that because it's fallen out of my notes. It's page 376 of the core bundle. So, 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 so even in their pleaded case, her reasonable expectation was that the third party would at least be required to pay most of her costs, base, most of her base costs, and that's precisely what's happened. Because £500 was recovered from the defendant, she was charged £321.25, that £321.25, in fact, it included the success of the element. So the, the, the extra charge in respect of her basic charges really is a very small sum. Did you calculate how much it was? Um, we, we have done in our skeleton, um, and I have to say, um, looking back at it this morning, I'm afraid I couldn't quite work out um, 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 <laughs> what our methodology was all those months ago. But, 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 Can't um, say I'm surprised at that. No. Well, and of course it is hard because the moment, as I said, because of the, the moment it's, you change not, the base The maths cost, isn't very difficult. Well, it, it, it is for, 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 for members of Four New Squares. Um, right, so where do I find the, the it's, sub? It, the it's, it's on your website. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting my live stream, but I need to take it. That was a facetious remark. <laughs> <laughs> um, In your skeleton. It's footnote four, page three, where we say there that the, 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 the What page of the bundle? Oh, I don't have it in the bundle. Can someone help me with that? Our skeleton. Um, our, our new skeleton. It's supplemental bundle. Supplemental, supplemental bundle. bundle. It, it, would be, it would be the first divided, so it's probably uh, about page four. Divided, uh, divided five. Page 96. Page 96, I'm grateful. £112.45. Sorry, wait, I'm, I'm not bothered. It's supplemental bundle, one Tap page. Five. Tap five. Page 96. Thank, Thank you. you. 
according to our footnote, as she was billed, and obviously the figures in our notes, our one-page summary are different because those are the those figures are based on what the judges below the, 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 the judges allowed, um, uh, that the, Mr. Justice Lavender allowed. That um, as as determined by the district on the base charges allowed by the district judge. Um, most of the £321 is success fee, but about £112 of it is, is, is unrecovered basic charges. Well, that's interesting, because you didn't get £208.80 success fee, you got 15%. But can you recover more by way of unrecovered basic charges, which, all, which is all we're concerned with on the fairness question, than the £112.45 you claim? Um, I... We, we, um, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm not quite sure I followed that, so forgive me. My understanding of what you've just shown us yes. is that we know that, that you said the total deduction was 82125 plus VAT. We'll ignore the VAT. Yes. The 82125, well, we know 500 of that is, is the fixed cost. So there's 321 There's 32125, left. which you claim to have recovered extra. Yes. We know that the order under appeal only allowed you to keep 75 of that. Yes. Again, ignoring. But, that. And that's, that's obviously because the basic charges have been reduced, yeah. Because Mr. Justice Lavender said you can have £500 of yes. basic, basic charges and you can have a success fee of 15% of that. Now, my understanding is everybody is proceeding in this appeal on the basis that your success fee is limited to 15% of your basic it charges. Is. Yes. But what we're arguing about is can you get more than £500 basic charges? Yes. And according to the note, the, what, what you claim in addition to what Mr Justice Lavender gave you is another two ninety five fifty. that being the difference between the three eighty five fifty. this is a bit complicated because you add the VAT in here, but, but it's whatever the 200 is, you take the VAT off. But this footnote four, for the, which is, I have to confess, I've not focused on before, shows that what you asked for by way of basic charges was not 200 and something, but 112.45. And, and if that's right, can you now ask this court to give you more than 112.45 for unrecovered basic charges? Can I just, uh, before I answer, can I just see, ask Mr. McDonald to put Well, from what Mr. McDonald is saying, it may be that the, the footnote is somewhat un, un, unhelpful because it's been described to me as, as a sort of notional split um, um, in, a, in, a, in an exercise the district judge himself did not conduct. But what the district, um, what essentially the, the exercise the district judge conducted is to say, well, um, the reasonable charges are um, the 1392 and then 15% successfully on that. But because you only build your client the 820 odd, then obviously what you build to operate is a cap, and so that is what you get. And, and yeah, all we're asking. Tight, it? Because what the district judge was saying was the reasonable base cost of 1392. So you would have been entitled to charge 15% of that as the success. Indeed. But you didn't, in fact, charge that. You, you only charged. Um, we simply applied it to. Uh, you only charged 321. We did. Because we just applied a 20. Fine. We just applied a percentage cap in the in the invoice that she was sent. And if we haven't even looked at the invoice, so technically that's what all this is about, but besides because it's unilluminating. What is 15% of 1392 as a matter of interest? Um, 15% of what? Of 1392. Um, well, it's about um, 100. But is that where you get the 208? I think so, it's because yes. it's about 208. It's 208. It? It's about 208. That's where the 208 yeah. comes from. So that's how I think we've yeah, got so it. Like, it, it. It might not be that it wasn't very helpful. So um, what you're really, your point, re yes, it is. It, it, it's really that it, it, the 15% is 208 80, and what the district judge was saying is you could, you could in fact have charged a total of 1392 plus the 208 80, Yes, exactly. But you only charge... Yes. Um, eight, yeah. So, I mean, I suppose it's a trick. The, well, the way that footnote works is that insofar as we gave the client a discount, it's attributing the whole of the discount to the basic charges. 
um, yeah. and, and you know, yeah. so, so that, 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 that's its problem. But we're, what we're certainly not attempting to do is, by some leisure demand, get more in, in basic charges than the client has ever been asked to pay. Yeah. Can I look at the, I'm sorry, having started down this route, can I look at the invoice you actually sent? Yes. Yes. So the, the invoice itself, I think you'll find at page 292 of volume one. Is this the statutory bill? This is the statutory bill. Is this the original, this is the original hearing bundle? This is the original, the core bundle as I've been calling it, yes. Probably. Why is a statutory bill called a statute bill? Why? Mm. Because it triggers the timetable under the statutes, namely, so. I the, never, but the, the name is, is ungrammatical. <laughs> well, right. No, I, actually, I, I, I tend to call it a statutory bill. But, um, but, but it seems universally to be called a statute mm -hmm. bill. That seems to be the, the, the jargon that's developed. Why? Well, <laughs> it's an idiom, I suppose. Sorry, which page, Mr. Williams? Uh, 292 um, 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 of the hard copy is the, is the bill. And then, there's a, a, a past, and then there's a breakdown of it at page, three, at page 307. Sorry, 307. Yeah, the 307 of the, of, so that would be uh, um, one page out for your lordship. Seven of the hard copy is a breakdown um, where you can see. Um, well, it, it gives. I mean, there's, there's as much detail as you want. But the, the, essentially, the, the document at 307 is the is the detail breakdown that's prepared for the district judge to work on when we get to the assessment. And it's, it's as a result of that that he he, he allows the um, 1392 odd for the basic. This, this bill is incredibly unclear. Right? The, are we talking? Sorry, the bill or the breakdown? Maybe. Yes. <laughs> I mean, the whole thing, I mean, I, I haven't looked at this, but I have looked at the one in SGI Legal, yes. which we're being asked to decide tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was a problem, but this um, seems to be more of a problem. And this doesn't tell you, because Mr. Justice Lavender, whose word I'd accepted, said that it clearly did something. But it doesn't seem to me clearly to me. Damages to client. I mean, you have to make the, your deduction to get to the 385 80. I think you have to deduct damages to client from damages. Um, because that explains what they did. Where does it say they're not asking for any money? Um. Well, they were, certainly. No, they weren't, were they? Um, it's, it's, so the, it's a page 299 where it just says balance of the above costs not recovered for the defendant, but capped at 25% of damages recovered. 299? 299. Yeah, agreed. It's actually not 25%, it's 20%, but be that as it may. Um, capped at 25% of damages recovered, 385.50, and paid with thanks. So it's marked as paid, there's nothing more due. Um, the only thing I can say about this. So where does it say nothing more due? Well, it's underneath it, stamped, paid with thanks, paid. Well, and the... Um, is, is that the point? It, I don't know. I think so. Yes, I was, I was just going to say. Balance of the above costs not recovered from the client, from the defendant. So that's the 2,102 40, but capped at 25% of damages recovered. Yes, and you, you'll know that this is from 2018, so this is more than a year after she's paid. So the, the, the point is that this, this is a document that was only created at the, at the, on the application of Check My Legal Fees for the purposes of allowing them to apply for the assessment. Well, okay. I mean... No, I mean, that isn't a sort of you know, adversarial remark. I'm just explaining that so this, is, this is not a document that some poor client gets in the post and has to understand. I understand, but the statute bill, as it's called, I would prefer to call it the statutory bill, ought to be clear. Well, of course it should, and as I say, I quite accept that um, if this was sent to a layperson, 
matters might look different, but this is a, simply a document that's been... I mean, the statutory bill ought to say what the solicitor's charges are, what has been paid, and what is now payable. In the clearest and starkest yeah, Of course they should, and I'm not disputing that. Well, I, I'm just saying yes. that because tomorrow that's going to be the subject of argument, and I can't remember if you're with us or not. Tomorrow. No, I'm not. Mr. MacDonald, I think, is, is, is right. here. Well, um, anyway, either way, um, that is going to be the subject of discussion. But statute bills, just because they are, arise after the event, is not an excuse for them being complex gobbledygook. No. No, well, I mean, but exactly. this one appears to be, if I may say so, um, subject to the same criticisms as the one in SGI legal. Yeah, well, as I say, so be it. Um, uh, um, um, and, and certainly, I don't, as I say, I wouldn't... Um, um, all I can say is that when the, 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 it's not suggested that in this case the form of the bill ultimately caused any confusion to anybody, apart from maybe, um, for understandable reasons, the unfortunate judges had to look at it on appeal. But, um, and obviously, I, I, I'm not, it's not part of my case to advocate that bills should be anything other than pellucid. No, I'm not really quite sure why we're going at this reply in this order. My fault. <laughs> <laughs> Can we try and do the reply right. in some sort of more discernible Well, order? yes. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think where I'd actually got to before I res responded to my Lord, Lord Justice Nugi, was to make the point that in the points of dispute, even in the points of dispute, they assert... Um, a reasonable expectation was the third party would be required to pay most, if not all, of the basic charges. So that even they have never suggested um, that um, uh, um, there was any expectation that she wouldn't have to pay any basic charges. And indeed, the, the, the paying party in the, in the personal injury proceedings did pay most of the basic charges. So she actually got what she says she was expecting to get. And that's why we say we treated her fairly, um, and notwithstanding the deficiencies in the documents, our duty to act in her best interest, we say, has been honoured throughout. And that's no doubt why she raised no complaints at the time and expressed no surprise at the fact she received 80% of her damages rather than 100% of them. In fact, if she had any surprise, it might have been that she got 80% rather than 75%. And that, that does, um, 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 as, as, as we say at paragraph four of our skeleton, everything that has followed since uh, um, um, has all of the hallmarks of being an ex post facto construct by the lawyers rather than any suggestion by Ms. Belson herself that she merits some form um, of remedy. Um, and, and when my Lord the Master of Wells said on day one, well, this court is all about justice, our rhetorical question was, well, what injustice has Ms. Belson actually suffered in the events that have happened? Of course, one can point to deficiencies in the contract, contractual documents and say, well, a different events could theoretically have happened. But in my respectful submission, and not only is this court concerned all about justice, but justice in the real world rather than in hypothetical situation, situations which did not come to pass. And there is nothing whatsoever to suggest um, are coming to pass in other cases either. Because we don't um, live um, in a world where there is any sort of ongoing national scandal about personal injury solicitors appropriating all of their clients' damages um, and more besides. And as my learned friend Mr Holland said, if they did, they'd be out of business practically um, overnight. Um, um, the, the only other point I will make about the unsatisfactory nature of the, the documents, I do respectfully uh, um, um, support what Mr Holland said about uh, really um, solicitors, uh, um, particularly in this sort of line of business, um, it's my word, not his, reeling from a decade of constant reform. Well, that's, um, the, well, that's the point about the CFA. Yes. The point about the CFA is the reason why it's 22 pages long is because over the years, it's got longer because the re regulatory and other requirements from solicitors have, have uh, mushroomed, as it were. And the challenges. I mean, no doubt, like, Mr. Holland may, may or may not know, but if, if we went back to the CF to, to the, the form of agreement at, after the Wolf reforms first came in, uh, when they were first permitted, uh, I'll bet you anything you like, it was less than 22 Well, I mean, c certainly there is going to be uh, a defensiveness, and of course, there's also defensive, mm -hmm. not, this is defensiveness, not just because of due diligence and the regulator, but also mm. because of the sort of technical challenges which this case exemplifies. Yeah. And I think my learned friend, Mr. Holland, um, I, 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 and again, let me give an example of that. Yesterday, we had for the first time ever, Mr. Kirby accepting it was something he dreamt up overnight. Uh, now your CFA actually has to specifically refer to Section 743 of the Solicitors Act. I think that's the sort of point that emerges, and of course that's just the sort of thing that you think, oh gosh, doesn't seem like a very good point, but perhaps we better change all of our retainers. 
because the consequences of getting it wrong may be so serious. Mm -hmm. And we may end up in front of the Master of the Pearls and the Chancellor uh, um, and, and, and another um, learned um, Lord Justice of Appeal uh, um, because, because we face this sort of challenge ourselves. And as Mr, Mr. Holland um, ref mentioned without asking you to look at it, uh, what Lord Justice Brookers, the Vice President of this division, said in Hollins and Russell, I'm not going to ask you to look at it either, but it is perhaps ju um, ju ju just worth reiterating it. So Lord Justice Brook was dealing in Hollins with a, a, a complaint that the documents were too long and there wasn't a sort of user-friendly summary. Um, um, and um, 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 and um, um, he said, it's, it's authorities, page 349, paragraph 153, no doubt if the solicitor if the solicitors had, had essayed a short letter summarising the effect of the CFA more briefly, the defendants would have complained that this abbreviated explanation did not explain its full effect and that the regulations had been breached for that reason instead. Um, and I'm afraid everything which we have seen uh, um, of the way in which uh, organisations like Check My Legal Fees operate, the mantra would be precisely the same. And as I've said, notwithstanding the, the, the general introduction in the market of, of overall contractual caps, my understanding is those CFAs are being challenged by Check My Legal Fees and their uh, imitators in precisely the same way as the CFA in this case. My, my Lord, so, so um, the second um, theme I was going to deal with much more briefly is, is the point about initial performance, the period of initial performance. Um, to the extent it matters, uh, we accept that Ms. Belsner agreed to appoint Cam on the phone on the 7th of March of 2016, um, and, and, and Cam accepted the appointment. The attendance note, a note uh, that we've seen before and won't turn up expressly records retainer documents were following by post. Clearly at that time, therefore, Ms. Belson had not accepted the terms that were being proffered. That happened later when she signs and returns them. And we haven't looked at it, but we've got the signed copy elsewhere in the bundle. It was the 12th of April. So in our submission, it's just a common and garden situation of performance starting in the anticipation of a contract being executed, and it was executed. Um, uh, until it was executed, there was no binding legal obligation because a CFA must be a written contract. And in any event, Ms. Belsner had a statutory right of cancellation uh, within 14 days as, because it's a consumer contract uh, um, 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 entered into through distance communications. Um, so, um, uh, um, and in our respectful submission, none of it's important because the only reason this period of initial performance is relied upon is to suggest that some sort of fiduciary duty emerged which has been breached the consequences of which is to make um, the um, Section 74.3 exemption unenforceable, all of which, of course, we disagree with. Um, and, and the first reason we say this period is unimportant, because notwithstanding this, this very short period of pre-contractual performance, um, the stipulation and agreement of the terms of business could not have been perceived um, as an arena within which the solicitors were acting in anybody's interest other than the, their own. Um, on to the issue of contentious business, I'll say extremely little about that. I, I should just mention uh, Mr., uh, sorry, Lord Justice Denning in Rio's solicitor. Um, our respectful submission is it's not relevant because it's a different act and different wording, significantly different. And in our submission, the point begins and ends now with the clear words of the modern statute. Um, but, but, but in any event, Mr Justice Wynne Parry's approach has stood for 60 years. As we've shown at paragraph 17 of our skeleton, it's adopted not just by the leading texts. It's recently been cited with the, it's recently been um, stated by the Supreme Court in the Bok case and the passage cited at 17. There's a case we haven't looked at from this court called Bilkus, uh, which for your note is at page um, 1492, one thinks of Christopher Columbus, of the authorities bundle. And at paragraph 45 of that, Lord Justice Stanley Burton says, a dispute does not render business contentious unless court or arbitration proceedings are involved. Um, yeah. uh, um, so, um, uh, in our respectful submission, um, they are um, the, the, the points on, on, on contentious business made by my learned friends, uh, friend, uh, Mr. Kirby, were without merit. Um, I think one, one point I, I do need to address you on um, is the subordinate argument. And with respect, my Lord, uh, um, the Chancellor, uh, was not unfair in characterising it as a reserve point. But as you know, we do maintain the argument that Section 74.3 relates to provisions to scales of costs and does not operate, uh, as my learned friends contend, to incorporate the current si system for fixed lump sums to be paid into parties. And that's where my learned friends showed you Lynch and Mr Justice Hughes, which I will turn up in, ask you to turn up in a moment. Before I do, for completeness, I should perhaps note that, in fact, um, we can't just treat scales of costs as historical artefacts. 
because scales of costs under the CPR, in fact, survived until this year uh, because there were scales of costs for the Patents County Court. And I think those have only just gone. Uh, um, where, for example, I, I had a look at out of interest. The, the most recent scale allowed £7,000 for particulars of claim and £7,000 for defence, a sort of classic item by item uh, particularised um, scale of costs. So they did survive into the CPR. In our submission, and, and I know I've made this point already, um, the statutory language envisages an assessment between solicitor and client which does not allow more for any given item that could have been allowed on assessment between the parties. And our simple point here is, is that under the inter-parties regime, there's no assessment between the costs, uh, between the parties, um, and there is no allowance for any uh, um, sums referable to individual items of cost. They're just global lump sums, and when you get outside uh, um, um, uh, um, the protocol and you go into the, the, the more elaborate fixed cost provisions of section 3A, it's all determined with reference to the amount of damages you recover. Um, so it's, it really has got nothing to do with the sort of item by item assessment that the statute is addressed at. Now, um, Mr Justice Hughes in the Lynch case, um, 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 in, in a passage which is unquestionably over to dicta, um, does come, uh, um, does express a, a view um, that um, is in disagreement with that. Um, and in the authority bundle, um, the passage that my learned friend uh, relies on is at paragraph 19, which is at page 420 of the paper of the paper bundle 421 of the electronic. Which time is it? Um, 21. 21, I'm grateful. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't have tabs. <coughs> Can I just, while well, your lordship's attorney it up, um, ju just, just, just make clear what the case was actually about. The case, in fact, entailed a completely misconceived argument. That, that, that Section 74.3 operated to limit solicitors to the sum that, was at, that had actually been assessed into parties. So what the client in that, the client in that case uh, um, had recovered £3,000 in the inter-parties assessment, and the, she challenged her solicitor's bill because it was greater than that sum, but on, inter -part, on, on solicitor client assessment, the cost judge allowed £7,000. Um, and this client said that was wrong. The cost judge should have applied 74.3 to, 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 to limit her liability to her own solicitor for the £3,000 she had actually recovered. Now, obviously, that was completely inconsistent with the wording of the statute because it uses the word could have recovered, not, not did recover. So, but that was the point, and I, I made that simply to show this isn't just obiter. In my respect of submission, it is notwithstanding the huge respect to anything um, falling from Mr Justice Hughes as he then was merits. Uh, um, it is obiter of a weak kind uh, because points about fixed costs uh, didn't even arise in that case. There's no argument about it. They didn't need to be looked at. Uh, this is pure sort of judicial aside. So what he, his lordship says at paragraph 19, let me increase my magnification slightly. Um, if I take it up at marginal C, um, uh, there he's referring to um, the, uh, the interface between yeah. um, the statute um, and the old scales of costs. Clearly, um, we um, agree with that. Um, then he goes on to say, slightly um, um, adjacent to marginal uh, C, um, the section does not simply survive, but is still intended to bite, and bite it does. Um, we agree that it might bite, because I've referred to the patent scale, um, and I don't have any difficulty with the proposition that it could bite on fixed fast-track advocates' fees, because fixed fast advocates' fees have got nothing in common with the inter-party system, which we're here looking at, the fixed lump sums determined with references damages. In fast-track cases, there is still a, an inter-parties assessment. It is just within that assessment, one item, advocate's fee for trial, is limited to, 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 to a prescribed amount. So, so, so fast-track fees, they can be reconciled with the statutory language because there is still an assessment. It still proceeds with an item and an item that is capped and something that looks a bit like a scale. The only difference being it's a scale with a single entry. <coughs> um, we do respectfully part company when the learned judge goes on to say, um, and this would also apply to fixed costs in small claims. Um, we don't accept that. The only inter-parties costs allowable in small claims are the fixed commencement costs, which even today for a claim of £5,000 are just £80. Um, and we don't, I don't accept that if I instruct a solicitor to recover a debt of £5,000, he can only charge me £80 even if the case goes to trial. Uh, um, and that is a scheme that is not within the ambit of Section 74.3 because there is no item by item assessment in small claims cases. Um, and so, so, in our respect for submission, Mr. Um, Justice Hughes really he, he's not needing to focus on this issue at all. And the fixed cost scheme he's, 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 
is really talking about British fast track trial fees. It's, got nothing, it's, it's completely different from the scheme we've got here. And in our respect, the submission of updated construction or not, it simply does not mesh with the statute. It is uh, a, 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 an apples and pears uh, um, um, comparison, if not more biologically radical in their difference. Um, my learned friend's new points then next about express reference being required to section 74.3 in our respectful submission, that is without merit. Uh, um, it is simply not what the rule says, and it would lead to the absurd consequence that it would suffice to say um, in a CFA, section 74.3 of the Solicitors Act does not apply full stop. Well, Mr. Kirby's argument that is sufficient, even though he rightly posited yesterday that even most solicitors wouldn't understand what that meant. Uh, uh, um, and in our respectful submission, um, that's a bad point. Um, my Lord, we then come to the um, approval agreement uh, distinction of language. In our respectful submission, a 46.92, its words are clear and unadorned and they don't need to be glossed. Is there an express agreement in writing? Uh, that is the test. Um, the words approval and agreement are different. Um, uh, um, and the position under 49.3, the 49.3 approvals are is also different. Under 49.3, what the solicitor is doing is he's trying to set up something uh, his client has, has approved in order to prevent the client from contending the costs that will otherwise be regarded as unreasonable mm. are, are, uh, um, can't be recovered. So they're essentially they're, you're trying to, 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 to prevent your client, uh, um, uh, um, well, you're trying to oblige your client to pay unreasonable costs um, mm. through their own approval. Um, and in my respectful submission, that is a different situation. Because all that 49.2 imposes is the usual rule. The, the usual rule you, 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 um, that, that, you're, that, that you pay your solicitor their reasonable costs. And can, may I also say that when my learned friend puts such great store on the cases about 46.93, like Herbert, and he also referred to McDougall and Blue um, none of those cases um, analyze this as a fiduciary duty question. The, the, the point in our submission is this the 46.93 presumptions are expressly said in the practice direction to be rebuttable. And that's, I mean, that, that's also key to unlocking this. If a client approves a solicitor's charges without being told relevant information they couldn't be expected to know themselves, then the, the approval's going to get you nowhere the because it's a rebuttable presumption. Um, and, 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 and you're going to rebut uh, um, um, the approval um, if, 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 if uh, well, the client approved it, but you didn't tell them X, Y, and Z, and, and they couldn't be expected to know it themselves. So th there is nothing in the case law about, uh, about 46.93 actually, which, which, which dictates a conclusion that 46.92 requires anything other than what it says it requires, which is a written agreement. My Lord, then fiduciary duty, um, I'm, 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 I might um, struggle for one, but I don't think I'll go very far after it. I've been in your Lordship's hands when we get to one o'clock. Um, Mr. Kirby, um, even after his, 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 his overnight um, reflection, frames matters as allegations of general breaches of fiduciary duty, but he's still in our respectful submission not precise, firstly about what specific fiduciary duties are owed and how they're said to have been breached. Um, and it is, um, and we kept referring to the celebrated analysis in Bristol and Western Mafia, uh, um, um, and what that case makes clear is that most fiduciary duties, such as reasonable care and skill and, and even double employment, are breached only if there is bad faith or intentional conduct. It's not generally enough for there to be simple inadvertence. And I hope this will be the last authority I invite you to turn up. But this is at page 230. Oops. Which case is it? Uh, uh, Bristol West and, and, and uh, the Mock You. The Mock You. Um, tab 13. <coughs> just going to invite your attention to two very short passages uh, from Lord Justice Millet. Um, the first at page um, bundle numbering, page uh, 230 marginal E to F. 230. 230 marginal E to F. So th the nature of the obligations determines the nature of the breach. And the various obligations of the fiduciary may be affect different aspects of his core duties of loyalty and fidelity. Breach of fiduciary obligation therefore connotes disloyalty or infidelity. Mere incompetence is not enough. A servant who loyally does his incompetent best for his master is not unfaithful and is not guilty of any breach of fiduciary duty. 
Well, that is the point that my lord, the master of the rolls, made to Mr. Indeed. To, to, to Mr. Kirby yesterday. This is all about loyalty and fidelity. Indeed, indeed. And, and um, a fortiori, it's not about negotiation. Where, where by definition, the parties are potentially, at least, um, on opposite sides. With no, nor is it about competence. No. Indeed, and, and duties of care are entirely different from, from duties of loyalty. And, and if, if one goes over just over the next page to 231, again, marginal F, um, this is talking about um, the, um, the breach of the duty of good faith. Um, conduct in breach of this duty need not be dishonest, but it must be intentional and un unconscious omission which happens to benefit one principal at the expense of the other. Um, this is a conflict of interest scenario. Does not constitute breach of fiduciary duty, though it may constitute a breach of the duty of skill and care very point which my lord has just put to me. Um, yeah. and I won't read the rest of it, but the whole uh, paragraph um, um, would doubtless be of interest. So in our respectful um, submission, the points about fiduciary duty don't take my learned friend anywhere, even at this first stage. Um, the Davis and London Prudential case doesn't help him um, either. Not only um, is it overturned, um, and it, not only is it dealing with, with transacting within pre-existing relationships, uh, um, 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 and, and it clearly is de dealing with the true self-dealing rule. Uh, this is a classic case of the, Mr. Kirby, in fairness to him, gave the perfect example of the, uh, the undisclosed relationship with the property developer. Uh, um, we're, the, the, uh, um, but um, that, that is 100 miles, we say, from this case. Um, and he has two other problems, which in our um, respectful um, submission, um, he hasn't um, really um, dealt with um, at all. Um, the first uh, um, is that even um, if that is right, uh, um, it doesn't render the agreement unenforceable. Um, as, a district, as, the, as the learned High Court judge seems simply to have assumed. Um, and secondly, um, um, even if, 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 if it gives rise to a right of some sort of remedy, um, um, certainly in cases that are absent bad faith or misconduct, uh, the, the remedy concern doesn't mean the serv that the agent doesn't get paid for the duties they've actually performed. It might, might mean they have to account for something. But, but even, even if you have a case of rescission, as I said yesterday, and Mr Kirby didn't reply on this point at all, um, you would have a right to count of restitution for the services you've rendered, and, and why would that be less than the sum the district judge allowed, which was 40% um, less than what he thought was the reasonable time cost for the work the solicitors did? Uh, wh wh why would the amount in count of restitution? And, and, and of course, there, there hasn't been a rescission, so, so if there was an attempt to say, well, in, in lieu of rescission, we want equitable compensation, but well, my rhetorical question is, well, equitable compensation for what? Yeah. Um, what is your loss? Uh, and, and again, my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji, uh, um, with respect, um, has already um, answered um, um, the points about uh, supposed common law duties. Um, well, a common law duty is a breach of that might give rise to a uh, right to damages. This isn't a damages claim. Uh, um, and, and whatever leeway uh, we might show people introducing new points because it's a test case, we can't turn a detailed assessment across into a damages claim. But any damages claim in our respectful submission would hit a brick wall because there isn't a loss. Um, so far as um, unfair terms are concerned, I've just got the two aspects of unfairness to deal with. So, uh, um, so far as unfair terms are, um, are concerned, um, um, after a certain amount of confusion uh, um, with respect to the way the case was presented, it, it did emerge ultimately as a discrete point. It's not the same point as, as fairness in assessment, because this point is about whether or not a contractual term is enforceable or unenforceable. And as I've already suggested, the term we're really here engaged with is, 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 is most obviously the one at page 340, you pay the difference. Now, in our respectful submission, uh, the first point is that is a term as to price. Uh, uh, um, it, is, it is transparent. The price is transparent. Uh, um, it hasn't been suggested uh, that, that there can be some sort of mar leasing um, reading down of the Consumer Rights Act, so, so, so transparency and prominence means anything other than those things. Uh, um, and in our respectful submission, it, it, it falls within the core exemption. But if we're wrong about that, then in our respectful submission, there simply cannot be anything unreasonable um, about um, a term um, or, um, that requires a, a claimant to pay a reasonable amount. As we've seen the legal position in law is a claimant is only ever liable to pay their solicitor a reasonable amount. And that is enforced uh, both by a, 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 right to, a statutory right of judicial assessment, which her contract refers to, um, and a statutory right of recourse to an ombudsman, a free ombudsman scheme, which again the contract refers to. Uh, and you take into account all the circumstances. The client has not chosen to put in any evidence that identify any circumstances <coughs> specific to her that makes it unfair to require her to pay an unreasonable, uh, to, 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 to unfair to require her to pay a reasonable price. 
Um, and it can hardly be said a term allowing a solicitor to deduct more costs than, re than is recovered is unfair. And it's very easy to forget when you're, you've spent three days bogged down in personal injury cases that you know, outside personal injury, in most cases you pay your solicitor whether you win or whether you lose. So it, it obviously can't be intrinsically unfair to pay your solicitor more costs than you recover because in 100% in, in of cases, uh, um, w w at least one party never recovers their costs and no, no one suggests it's unfair that they have to pay. So it, and, and, and uh, uh, if one actually looks at the statute, um, and I think um, my Lord the Chancellor made an observation about this in argument yesterday. We get those indicative terms um, in Schedule 2. Um, before you get to Schedule 2, you actually have to have, you can actually get a pretty good clue as to what the, um, the Act is concerned about, which is imbalance. Uh, the term is unfair for case, an imbalance in the party's rights and responsibility. And when you get into the indicative terms, the indicative terms are things like of the supplier having a, a contractual right to alter the price or alter the terms of performance, but the consumer not doing so. It's an absence of mutuality. And in my respect for submission, uh, this, again, with apologies for the cliché, um, is a thousand miles away from that. Um, so in my, our respectful submission, uh, um, um, unfair terms is also a, 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 a bad point. Um, if I come lastly to um, fairness, um, it, it is perhaps here um, there was something that the, my Lord the Master of the Royal said towards the end, um, which m may still suggest that we are, are not quite on, or, or that I haven't presented my case as clearly as I should have done. I mean, this is a case about basic charges, and the, obviously the whole case is about can we charge the £280 odd that Mr Justice Lavender disallowed. The whole of that sum is basic charges. I mean, um, so, so, so that's what, and, and so the question is, uh, um, on a, on it's nothing to do with success fee. It's nothing to do. The success fee is just <coughs> will, will, would change slightly because well, the it success fee is, is, is dictated by what, what precisely. It, 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 it's, it's just a, it's just a, 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 a modest surcharge on the basic well, charge. What, what, what it amounts to is you, you saying the district judge got it right, albeit he got it right by the contentious business route rather than the non-contentious yes. business route. But he basically got it right. Yes. The new Court of Appeal should restore the position to what it was before. Indeed, it. indeed. And, and, and just to make a very few points, with apologies if it takes me to five past one, but I, I hope it won't be more than that, because I'm obliged. Um, so simply, can I also, I don't want to be overly technical about this, and I, I hope I don't need to be, but I do firstly want to make the point that this is her application for assessment. It is her that told the district judge that these are contentious costs. When we were given permission by Lord Justice Mells, um, to raise the non-contentious point. At that point, they could have put in a respondent's notice you know, raising points about unfairness, saying, well, even if it is non-contentious, it's still unfair, they didn't do so. So whilst your lordships you know, may choose or choose not to give some, some wider guidance, in my respect for submission, it is not a point in this case. Uh, we are where we are because they went to the district judge saying it's contentious business, and they haven't, um, they haven't resolved from that even into this case. But, 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 but with that preliminary marker, in our respect for submission, if this is determined by reference to fairness, well, the first point to note is, is absolutely everyone from the Supreme Court downwards, very recently in the Bott case, have said, well, fairness really doesn't add very much. Uh, you know, it's basically the same. For them to succeed, they did not appeal the district judge, finding that the reasonable cost would have been £1,362. Um, so to get back down to Lord Mr Justice Lavender, they have to say that introducing the criterion of fairness reduces the cost the district judge held would have been reasonable by 64%. And in our respectful submission, you really only have to state that to see that it can't possibly be right. Um, as my learned friend Mr Holland has rightly said, um, the primary concern of the court uh, in the context of a non-contentious assessment is, is the bill. You're assessing the bill. You're not assessing the contract. You're not assessing what the system might have charged. You're not conducting a disciplinary uh, um, um, it's not a disciplinary jurisdiction where you punish solicitors for having bad or excessively complex paperwork. That's all a matter for the regulator. And it's much more satisfactory for the regulator to, to penalise things like that in my submission or the Ombudsman. Can I ask you the same question I asked the other two? Is this, or do we need to decide, a non contentious business agreement? The answer, well, the first, shall I answer them in the other, back to front? Um, you don't need to decide it, and the reason you don't need to, there are a number of reasons you don't, but the most obvious one is, is as we've seen, a non-contentious business agreement only arises if on assessment, the solicitor asserts, you're not entitled to assessment because I've got a non-contentious business you agreement. You never said that. My clients never asserted that, so that, that's a complete answer. Um, 
um, whether or not it would be helpful to the, the profession, because of course, you know, if your lordship is, if your lordships were to be with me on this all being an uncontentious business, uh, I think there would be a fairly safe assumption that either check my legal fees or organisation sort of rising from their ashes um, will, in due course, be saying, "Oh well, we want an un these are uncontentious business agreements. We want to have them set aside." So I suspect it's, it's but a the point, point to make about them non-contentious business agreements. The point that I debated with Mr. Holland that look, if you look at the section. Section 57.5. What, what, what make, that makes clear is that, that, that there are agreements under which the solicitor basically, by one route or another, says, I'm entitled to be paid X. Yes. Full stop. The client can go to assessment. If the client goes to assessment and the top cost judge says there is a non contentious business agreement which is enforceable, then it is full stop. That's an end of it. But if on the assessment the client establishes that the, that the agreement is not fair and reasonable and should be set aside, then there will just be an assessment. Yes. But when you put it in those terms, this clearly isn't a non-contentious business agreement. No, quite. Because nowhere in this agreement does it say that our fees will be £2,500 and you will have to pay £2,500. Indeed. Uh, well, I don't dissent with respect to any of that, but I do also make an additional point, which I made in my intervention. I'll move on then immediately. Is It also can't be a non-contentious business agreement because it expressly applies to contentious business. Now, the fact that in the result there wasn't any contentious business can't mean that it is, it, 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 therefore, because, because you have to, the point, you have to be able to decide when the agreement is entered. Am I subject to the non-contentious regime or the contentious regime? If it is capable of extending to contentious business, if it, particularly where it expressly says that if there is contentious business, this will be covered, then it can't be a non-contentious business agreement. It is, the agreement is not an agreement for non-contentious business, it, because, it, because it permits contentious business if there is any, it's, it's within the scope of the agreement. So they're not non-contentious business agreements, but either they were, it, it doesn't matter because we're not relying on it to preclude an assessment anyway. Um, my, my, my Lord, as to why we say there is simply no unfairness, or simply no unfairness that, that merits a remedy greater than that which my client volunteered in limiting its contractual um, rights to um, um, nearly £1,400 uh, to um, um, £821, uh, uh, um, will, will be obvious um, from what I've said already. She agrees to a success fee, uh, um, which she's told can be up to 25%. Um, she has less than that deducted for everything, including the success fee. She is expressly told on multiple occasions that um, there is a short, that there's likely to be a shortfall. Uh, I mean, it's true. In one place, they say all or part. That unfortunately, that's, that's that's all or part is something they picked up from the Law Society CFA. It's Law Society language. The Law Society CFA hasn't been updated to reflect the increase in fixed costs. But they, they do actually go on to say that over the page from that. But there, there is this scheme for, for road traffic cases worth less than £25,000 where you do only get fixed costs and, and, and we reserve the right to look to you for the difference. So that is spelled out over the page. And that's in the client care letter, the one document you might actually expect her to read. So it is spelled out. And as I've said, we, she hasn't put in any evidence whatsoever. Uh, um, and in her, uh, we have to therefore proceed on the assumption against her that she is a sophisticated client capable of looking after her own interests. But as I've said, the one thing we do have is her points of dispute, and her points of dispute say, I had a reasonable expectation that most, if not all, of the inter-parties costs would be recovered from the other side, and that is precisely what she got. Um, the only other point um, that I um, was, 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 was just going to, to, to just mention extremely briefly, and it may be that I will be asked not to because it just isn't seen to arise. I don't want to get into what would be characterised as jury points, but there is this wider concern about the, 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 the costs which the cumbersome nature of the um, Solicitors Act is, 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 is causing by forcing people into the High Court. And I just wondered if I, I, I might, might just say, say one thing about that, either from the perspective of your Lordship's given any guidance you may choose to give in the future, or even if one is thinking about revising the rules. Um, the, the irony, the problem we have here is also a, an ironic problem, because it, it comes from Solicitors Act proceedings being dealt with under Part 8. Um, and, what, and Part 8, of course, is, is meant to be there for very straightforward cases where there are no substantial disputes of fact. Uh, and one of the quirks of part, uh, of part 8 is it expressly excludes allocation. It, it's, it's, um, there is no allocation of Part 8 claims. Yeah. Um, um, it actually says they're treated as allocated for multi-track, which I, I think just it just does that. So there's no cost budgeting, and there's, there's, there's so I'm not, I don't mean no cost budgeting. So there's no, um, you know, you don't worry about fixed costs and things. But it, they're not actually allocated for multi-track; they're just treated that way. 
Um, to, 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 from, a, from, a, from, a, from a historic perspective, in our submission, however, Rule 8.1 says, at any time a court may order the Part 8 claim will instead proceed under Part 7. So there is, in fact, nothing to stop a court uh, um, saying, well, I've looked at this Part 8 claim, um, it's ridiculous um, for it to be treated as a multi-track claim, I'm transferring it to Part 7, I'm allocating it, and then it can be allocated to the small claims track or the fast track to reflect um, um, the, the, the disproportionality that might otherwise ensue. Um, if, if that's not right, then I would respectfully suggest one thing the court might want to think about going forwards uh, um, as commending to rule makers is to whether there should be an express flexibility to reallocate Part 8 claims so that Part 8 claims that are of very low financial value um, can be referred uh, to the small claims track if, 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 if that's what the court deems appropriate. And I, I, obviously, because of the Solicitors Act, there's a particular problem in this area. But there is another area where there's quite a lot of litigation about this at the moment, which is data protection claims. And quite a lot of those are being started in, in the High Court um, um, because, um, of the, um, because, of, because, of, because of the media list, which, of course, is exclusively High Court and, and privacy cases which impact on privacy are treated as, as media cases. But certainly in those, the Queen's Bench Masters, I know, are just um, sending them down to the County Court uh, um, and commending that they be allocated uh, to an appropriate track. Um, now, we can't do that uh, um, with Solicitors Act cases because of the statutory limitation of the jurisdiction to the High Court. But as I say, I, I, for my part, I haven't seen anything in the rules that actually stops the High Court allocating a case to the small claims track. <laughs> Yes, my, my, my learned friend is asking me, what, is there an issue with, with, say, allocating the small claims track? Because the Solicitors Act says, uh, um, essentially says the cost of the assessment will follow the event of the assessment, the 20% rule. But in my respectful submission, not. Because all, all that says is, is the court must uh, decide the incidence of costs in a particular way. But it doesn't in any sense say the costs have to be uh, full indemnity basis inter partes costs or standard basis costs. I mean, if, 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 for example, there was a fixed cost scheme, uh, um, for Solicitors Act assessments. Uh, um, in my respectful submission, that wouldn't be ultra vires the Solicitors Act. The, the, the solicitor, there would be fidelity to the Solicitors Act. One would say, well, the costs follow the event of the assessment. The costs in question are prescribed by the rules of being fixed costs, which in the case of small claims might be very small costs indeed. But in any event, I, 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 clearly that's not part of this case. But, but, but I, I, I do put it out there because really, even if one, if I step back from my obligations to my clients and just try to adopt a completely neutral approach to this case, the one thing that does is strike one as, 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 as absolutely bizarre and, 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 and disproportionate is Mr. Justice Lavender and now this court uh, um, dealing with these extremely small cases. Uh, um, and as we have seen in the SGI case, the solicitors get 48 times more out of it than the sum that's actually in dispute. Uh, and in our respect, that's exactly the sort of of circumstances, the small claims track is, is, is really there to resolve, and if it can resolve it going forwards, it, that, that would be helpful to everyone, except a few people who've invested in a particular business model. My Lord, I, I apologise for taking slightly longer, and I also know that at times I've been going like a tobacco auctioner, because I, I, uh, be, because I, I, I know that you wanted me, me to finish uh, this. You, you must know more about tobacco auctions than I do, sir. Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Williams. I've got a new one. Thank you very much. Mr. Williams, we're grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yes, are we going to get a transcript or not? Yes, I believe yeah, so. I think we've got some yes. come through. So, yeah. I have one. Mm -hmm. Could I be send them electronically? Yes, I, that's I know my instructing solicitor has been on to that. I don't quite know where we've got to, but it's. Um, we will, perhaps you won't be surprised, not to be giving judgment at two o'clock. <laughs> um, we will take time to consider our judgments. When we do, we'll hand them down in the usual way. We will hand them uh, down in draft to the people who have communicated with the court their email addresses. It will then be up to those people to decide, and there'll be solicitors and counsel, whether any other person, namely a client, needs to see them for the purposes mentioned in the um, Counsel General for Wales. Uh, you should be aware as to the very strict terms of the embargo, and we will not be leaving a great deal of time between hand down and delivery. Um, the only thing 
I uh, would say also is that uh, you should agree um, directions and the order that arises from our uh, judgments, and if you can't agree them, we'll decide that question on paper. Thank you. But uh, I would like to thank all the parties for what uh, has been a very interesting argument, councillor and solicitors. I know it's about a small sum of money, but it does have ramifications for the profession and for um, personal injury business widely. And so whilst it may have taken some time, hopefully that time will not have been wasted. Um, and uh, it, we hope we'll be able to assist whatever we decide as to the legal question. So thank you very much. Thank you, my lord.